esteemed audience and press, warm welcome to this award ceremony. I'm Professor Camilla Hollanti, and it's my utmost pleasure to be here today as a representative of Aalto University and the Finnish National Committee for Mathematics. I'll be serving as the master of ceremony for this event. I'm honored to introduce Mr. Sauli Niinistö, President of the Republic of Finland, and would like to give our special thanks to him for accepting this invitation at such a short notice. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, dear Congress participants and guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for Finland and our national scientific community to have the International Mathematical Union Congress in Helsinki today. Last time, Finland has a chance to host your meeting in uh, 1978. Over the next few days, international delegations will have the opportunity to meet each other and share the latest news. Some award ceremonies uh, will also take place as uh, it is time to award the Fields Medals. The Abacus Prize for Mathematical Computing which is uh, sponder, uh, sponsored by University of Helsinki, will also be awarded at this Congress. Finland is a country of people with uh, curious minds. As a nation, we have performed well in the field of mathematics. For this, we owe special thanks to the Finnish teachers who have been encouraging generations after generations to learn and ask the right questions. Similarly, <clears throat> mathematics is a story of thirst of knowledge. After all, the Greek word for mathematician, mathematikos, stands for font of learning. The humankind learned to count before they learned to write. Trading would have been impossible without an understanding of the number of prices or products. But uh, most important, at least in my mind, is that mathematics gives basis for logical thinking, whatever you're doing. If I were again beginning my studies, I would follow the advice of Plato and start with mathematics. This quote from Galileo Galilei still holds true. I found it uh, as a minister of finance, listening to one colleague who used to start his uh, speech sometimes that uh, there are three kinds of us uh, ministers of finance, those who can count and those who cannot count. <laughs> Distinguished <coughs> scientific uh, community, originally the intention was to arrange this event in St. Petersburg, Russia. Unfortunately, the events in Ukraine over the past few months have demonstrated the capacity of human mind to do utterly destructive deeds. As uh, human beings, it is our task to do everything we can to end the war and to help the people of Ukraine. In the same way, the scientific community can also extend a helping hand. For example, Finnish higher education institutions have offered places of study, accommodation and support for the Ukrainians who have come to Finland. It has been told that uh, mathematicians are always right. Their progress is uh, in other fields 
of science, often about correcting earlier theories. Mathematics is about expanding them. The learned people with a field bring something new to earlier knowledge. Very seldom the situation is such that they would need to abandon their present theories. I believe and I hope that you will do the right thing again. You mathematicians have been <coughs> driving change and you will be changing all our lives, even in the future, with your new ideas. I welcome you all to the <coughs> summary Helsinki and wish you a very successful Congress. And please do enjoy the very typical Finnish summer weather. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, President Niinistö. Then let me warmly welcome Professor Carlos Kenick, President of the International Mathematical Union. Please join me for welcome. Thank you all for being here. <clears throat> Distinguished dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Welcome to the IMU award ceremony, the first one to be held in more than 100 years of IMU history. Today we will announce the winners of the IMU prizes. These are the four Fields medals, the brand new Abacus medal, the Chern medal, the Gauss Prize and the Lilavati Prize. These are amongst the most prestigious awards in mathematics. As many of you probably know, normally these awards are announced during the opening ceremony of the Quadrennial International Congress of Mathematicians, ICM. Because of the brutal and unprovoked Russian invasion of Ukraine, the Executive Committee, EC, of the IMU decided at its virtual meeting in February 2022 to cancel its in-person General Assembly and International Congress of Mathematicians scheduled to take place in Russia this July. The EC also decided then to have instead an in-person General Assembly outside of Russia and a fully virtual ICM, and to also have, for the first time, an in-person award ceremony on the day between these two events. The ongoing barbaric war that Russia still continues to wage against Ukraine clearly shows that no other alternative was feasible. After receiving several generous offers from our members to host the in-person events, for which we are very grateful, the EC decided to accept the extremely generous offer from Finland and the Council of Finnish Academies to host these events in Helsinki, and here we are now. This live award ceremony that is also live streamed gives us all, and especially the laureates and their loved ones, the opportunity to celebrate in person the outstanding achievements for which the laureates are being recognized today. Without further ado, let us now turn to the announcing and awarding of the prizes. The Fields Medal is awarded every four years to recognize outstanding mathematical achievement for existing work and for the promise of future achievement. It is awarded to four recipients under 40 years of age. The medals and cash prizes are funded by a trust 
established by J.C. Fields at the University of Toronto. Since the trust has, over the years, become underfunded, we are very grateful to the Heider Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation for the generous donation to close this funding gap from this year on. The Fields Medal Committee finished its deliberations in early January 2022. The awardees were notified in mid-January. The committee was chaired by myself as president of the IMU. The rest of the members were chosen by the EC. Their names have remained secret up to now. They are Artur Avila, Camilo de Lelis, Michael Hopkins, Antti Kupiainen, Rahul Pandaripande, Alfio Quarteroni, Lorsa Remo, Vera Serganova, Richard Taylor, Wei Ping Zhang, and Tamar Ziegler. I would like to thank them on behalf of, their, of the IMU for their tremendously hard work and their exemplary service to the mathematical community. I now call to the stage our sponsor, Beate Spiegel, from the Heidelberg Laureate Forum Foundation. Unfortunately, no representative of the University of Toronto could be here today. Thank you, Beat. So, uh, our first, uh, we're going to go in alphabetical order. The first uh, prize announced is for Hugo Duminil Copa from the University of Geneva and the IHES, the Institut des Autitudes Superiores. Gordon Winil Copin is awarded the Fields Medal 2022 for solving long standing problems in the probabilistic theory of phase transitions in statistical physics, especially in dimensions three and four. Next uh, awardee is Jun Ha from Princeton University. Jun Ha is awarded the Fields Medal 2022 for bringing the idea of Hodge theory to combinatorics, the proof of the Dowling-Wilson conjecture for geometric lattices, the proof of the heron rota welsh conjecture for matroids, the development of Lorentzian polynomials, and the proof of the strong Mason conjecture. Our next awardee is James Maynard from the University of Oxford. <laughs> J. 
James Maynard is awarded the Fields Medal 2022 for contributions to analytic number theory, which have led to major advances in the understanding of the structure of prime numbers and in Diophantine approximation. So our uh, last Fields medalist is, but not least, is uh, Marina Vyazovska from EPFL. So EPFL is the Ecole Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne, and uh, Marina Vyasovska is awarded the Fields Medal 2022 for the proof that the E8 lattice provides the densest packing of identical spheres in eight dimensions, and further contributions to related extremal problems and interpolation problems in Fourier analysis. Warm con congratulations to all the medalists. Our plan ahead now consists of a video and laudatio for each of the field medalists, and Professor Kenick will introduce the laudators. Okay, so we will start with a video on regard Dominique Coupin, and further on, there will be the Laudatio by Martin Herrer from Imperial College. Smartness is not that relevant for being creative in math. It's more about your experience and your sensibility. These things are going to shape your vision of the world and it's going to make you think about something that somebody else would never think about. It is important that everybody finds what he likes in life. I'm very lucky I'm doing a job that I enjoy. My work and my passion are the same thing, so I hope I can show how beautiful math is and how amazing being a mathematician is. I'm currently a professor at the University of Geneva. For me, math is really something that I share with people. When learning mathematics, we are told not to make mistakes, but that doesn't match my experience as a mathematician. I cannot tell you the number of wrong arguments I describe to my collaborators, but often they just bounce on it and realize that this is saying something else. They say, you know, no, your thing is wrong, but look, if you modify it, then it's saying something interesting. Making mistakes is just an important component of the creative process, and you have to teach younger people how to accept that. Once they start to get it, math becomes more joyful. <laughs> Statistical physics is about deriving global properties of a huge system by analyzing the interactions between its tiny constituents. When you try to do so, you realize that these systems are extremely complex. Think of a fountain. If there is wind, everybody knows that the water is pushed in its direction. 
But there is no way you can track the behavior of each drop of water. So, what do you do? Instead of trying to understand the behavior of each drop, you look at the probability of how the drops behave. And by forgetting this hopeless quest of understanding the entire system, you can do something simpler, which is to look at what is the typical behavior of the system. What is true for fountains is also true for other phenomena. And the one that is dear to me is the question of magnetism. Magnets are made of tiny constituents we call dipoles, and their interaction is extremely complex. So again, you use probability to construct a system, and this is called the easing model. Now, there have been thousands of papers on this model, but most of them were not dealing with the dimension of real magnets. My co-authors and I developed a new probabilistic insight based on what is called percolation theory. Its aim is to understand the phenomenon of a liquid moving through something, like water over rocks. It turns out that these properties are linked to the dipoles in the easing model. Imagine you put a bottle of water in your freezer. When it reaches zero degrees, the volume changes and the bottle explodes. This is a discontinuous phase transition. For magnetization, things are different. Imagine you pick a magnet on your fridge and you heat it. The strength will decrease continuously until it reaches zero at what we call the critical temperature. Your magnet won't stick to the fridge anymore. It's an example of a continuous phase transition. It's what you see in your everyday life, but it's very difficult to prove mathematically. But using percolation theory, we did finally answer this question in the three-dimensionalism one. The most beautiful thing is that you can apply percolation to very general statistical physics systems. Of course, it comes at a cost, which is that the percolation models are more and more complicated. That's why it's very important to me to keep trying to discover new mechanisms in percolation in order to build the most general and robust theory possible. I'm also a permanent professor at the Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques. I was raised in Bursurivet, where the Institute is, so it's a little bit like getting back home. The Institute has been one of the most important places for the development of algebraic geometry. Being the first professor in probability means that I should also make this place an important place for probability itself. After I arrived at the Institute, we put blackboards outside in the park. When you walk in nature, part of your body is just not really with you. It's in the place where you are. And the other part, which is the one doing math, is somehow doing it better. As a young mathematician, I was super enthusiastic, always doing research, sometimes not managing to find sleep. I was just too much into it. But then my wife Severine and my daughter Anael came and they showed me how to, you know, sometimes step back and enjoy these other things that are outside of math. It changed me as a mathematician. I had less time, but it was better time. Severin teaches philosophy and French in high school. We have been living in France next to Geneva for many years. My work is crucial. I love my work. I, I live for my work. But I also live for the rest of my life. And I never want that to change. So next we have Martin Herer from Imperial College doing the Laudatio. Thanks, Martin. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I hope this is going to work. <laughs> so it's a, it's a fantastic pleasure and honor uh, to have been uh, given the opportunity to say a few words about Hugo's research. And 
So I'm going, oh, huh. is this going to, okay, let's see if that thing actually manages to see the laptop, which had to be put over there. Yes, that actually works. Okay, so I want to give you some kind of quick, very short overview uh, of some of the results that Hugo has obtained. So I'm going to try to keep it at a sort of relatively elementary level, uh, in particular to try to give you, you know, some sort of intuitive feel for the type of mathematical problems uh, that Hugo's been interested in. So I listed here uh, a number of uh, a number of problems that uh, Hugo managed to solve, and don't worry if you have no idea of what this means, I'm going to try to give you some kind of idea. Um, but many of his results actually um, have to do with a, pro with a model called the POTS model, and in particular the, he proved the conjectured value of the critical temperature for this model, which had been conjectured. Uh, a long time ago in the physics literature. He resolved the Baxter's conjecture, which was also um, set up in the 70s uh, by Baxter in the physics literature. He proved large-scale rotational invariance for the cl critical um, pots and random cluster model. He proved sharpness of phase transition, and then he also proved the continuity of phase transition in the three easing model, and triviality, and that's triviality not to say that uh, it's trivial to somehow prove this. So triviality here means that the large-scale behavior is Gaussian, and so in that sense, from a physical point of view, the theory is trivial uh, for the four-dimensional critical easing model, which is a very famous open problem that was resolved. Um, and so I want to actually talk about the four first problems because they give a kind of unified storyline. Um, and so that's all about the uh, POTS model, and so just to give you a very quick idea of what this model is, is you take a finite graph, and on each, each vertex of the graph, you give it a color. So you have Q different colors, so Q could be like three, so you color them red, green, blue. Um, and the typical sort of graph you should think about is a large chunk of a square lattice, or maybe a cubic lattice, or something like this, right? And then, you assign probabilities to these colored graphs, and the way you do it, you don't do it uniformly. You do it at random, but not uniformly at random. What you say is you want to make it more likely that neighboring vertices in the graph have the same color. And so every time they have the same color, you give it sort of a bonus in terms of the likeliness, uh, which is a factor k, and that bonus, you, kind of, you can tune how strong that bonus is, right? So k equal one would mean that they're all equally likely, um, and the larger k is, the more of a bonus you get for having two neighbors the same color, right? And there's also a generalization of this. One can make sense of that model for non-integer values of k, and actually all of Hugo's results work for that generalization, um, but I'm just going, we're going to keep with you know, the concrete case of coloring uh, graphs. And it's kind of known, it's been known for a long time that these kind of models uh, exhibit a phase transition. That means that for large values of k, and now this thing doesn't work anymore, uh, for large values of k, I have to actually <laughs> move down here. <laughs> the computer is supposed to be up there, but there's a problem with the video link. Um, so for large values of k, um, what you're going to see is that the graph is mostly colored in one color, and there's sort of little bits of a different color. And for small values of k, it looks basically random. So I'm going to actually show you what this looks like. So here, I have four colors, and k is equal to five. Um, and what I've done here is I've, so the graph here is the screen. Every pixel is a vertex of the graph and neighboring pixels are neighbors in the graph, okay? Uh, there are four colors, red, green, blue, and purple. Um, and well, here it evolves in time and it evolves in time so that eventually the equilibrium would be precisely the measure that I just described. And what you see here is that for the large values of k, well, you have different colors showing up, but eventually one of them wins. So here, clearly, red is going to win. Uh, and you see that in the end, there's going to be mostly red. You see there's a bit, a bit of flickering in the red, which shows that it's not completely uniformly red, but there's just a bit of other colors that survive, right? Um, 
if I take a lower values of k, like 3, for example, it looks like that, right? So now uh, it looks sort of much more random. If I make it even lower, if I take a value of like 2, you know, it just looks like this. And so clearly here, um, you see the behavior is completely different. Uh, you essentially, if I just pause this for a second, uh, you know, it's not that neighbors are completely independent. You see that there are sort of little chunks of green, little chunks of blue. They are more than just one pixel large. Uh, but clearly, it's completely disordered somehow. It's a completely different behavior. Um, and so there is actually one specific value of k at which the change occurs from one behavior to the other. And so that brings us to the so first result, which is the, this value of that critical value. And so it turns out, in this case, there's some kind of duality. Um, and from that duality, one can guess this value. Um, but that just somehow says that there is a value which is special. Uh, and it's not completely clear that this special value is really the special value in which the behavior changes from mostly one color to you know, completely disordered. And that was the first uh, result I wanted to mention, which is that, well, Befara and Dominique Copin in 2012 proved that the conjecture that this self-dual value, which is 1 plus square root of the number of colors, is indeed uh, the critical temperature. So I can, if you want, prove this here to you, because here you have four colors. So 1 plus square root of 4 is 3, right? And so the theorem says that the critical value is 3. So you see here 2, we're clearly below. If I go to even 2.8, we're clearly below. It's just that these clusters sort of get a bit larger, right? If I go to 2.9, uh, they go a bit larger, but it's clearly still disordered. Whereas if I go to something like 3.1, uh, then you start to see that these clusters really grow, and eventually one of them is going to take over, and you see mostly just one color, right? Um, now, the other result that I wanted to mention, which is Baxter's conjecture, which is, say, you know, what actually happens when you're close to that specific critical value, right? And now, there are two possible things that you could imagine, right? So on the one hand, you know that if you're above, then um, there are, for each color, there is somehow one measure which corresponds to the graph being mostly colored in that color and then little bits in the other color. Whereas if you're below the critical temperature, it's completely disordered. There's only one, if you want, infinite volume limit uh, for this thing. And now, as you approach the critical value, um, there are two possibilities. So sort of either you could have both a disordered one and ordered ones, where one color dominates, or there could actually just be one infinite volume measure where nobody dominates. And it turns out that that depends on the number of colors. And so the conjecture by Baxter in the early 70s was that it depends on whether you have more than four colors or four or less colors. And so if you have four or less, then the transition is continuous in the sense that at the critical temperature, you still, on average, all the colors show up so with the same probability, whereas above, there's still a dominant color that comes out. Um, and that was proven in two um, very nice articles recently by uh, Hugo and co-authors. And one way of actually illustrating this is you can start, I can take a initial condition which is triangular, so you have sort of red top left and green bottom right, and I take boundary conditions so that the system is forced, the graph is forced to be colored red on the left and top boundaries, and it's forced to be colored green on the right and bottom boundaries, right? And so now there are two different behaviors as you approach the critical value. So here at 4, which is part of Q less or equal to 4, so that's where it's supposed to have uniqueness. So if I'm at the critical value, which is 3 in this case, so what do you see? Um, you see that the boundary between green and red starts to really sort of you know, go all over the place. Right? It sort of more or less covers the whole screen, and you have big chunks of blue and purple that appear as well. Uh, and that somehow suggests that in this case, 
if we let it run for a while, actually, even though the boundaries are sort of only purely green or red, if this were quite large, sort of in the middle of the picture, you wouldn't really see the color of the boundary, right? Now, if I go to the case of nine colors, right, so uh, if I change the total number of colors to nine, so now, of course, three is no longer the critical value because one plus square root of nine is four, right? So if I go to four uh, and I reset this, so now you see the behavior is actually quite different. So what, what you see here, you see that the green and the red regions, they actually remain quite well separated. So even though we are at this critical value, uh, there is one well-defined region where green dominates, there's one where red dominates, and in between, there's you know, a chunk of this disordered region where um, neither of them dominates. And the way you transition from order to disorder is that this disordered region in the middle sort of broadens out and kind of eats up the whole screen as soon as you go below the critical temperature, right? Which is a very different mechanism from what happens for less than four colors, where it's actually just the boundary between the two regions that sort of becomes uh, more and more convoluted and so that eventually kind of all the colors uh, eat up the whole screen, right? So you have a very different behavior uh, for Q less than four and Q bigger than four, and that was proven by uh, Hugo and his co-authors. And then the remaining two results I just wanted to mention, which are in the same type of model, is, well, there is, uh, in these two-dimensional models at this critical value, it's uh, well known that they are very strongly related to another branch of mathematics, which is conformal, two-dimensional conformal field theory. Um, and the, uh, the property that makes that link is that at the critical value, when you look at the large-scale behavior uh, of these uh, colored graphs, if you want, they have some kind of conformal, they exhibit some conformal invariance. So in the sense that if you, you take a chunk of graph that is in the form of some domain and then you map this conformally to another domain, uh, then what you see is more or less the same as if you just took a chunk of graph in that other domain and did your simulation. Um, and this is something which is extremely hard to prove. It's still an open problem for this model to show that this is conformally invariant. Um, and of course, conformal invariance is some kind of a union of scale invariance and rotation invariance. And of course, scale invariance at large scale is true by definition. Um, and so rotation invariance is something that you would like to know. And that was uh, one of the results, and which is of course now an extremely important step uh, towards conformal invariance. And the uh, last result I wanted to just mention before my time is up is sharpness of the phase transition. So what, what does this actually say? Well, there are two ways, if you want, of finding, like, so the, the way I defined here the critical value or the critical temperature is that below no color dominates so on average, if you want to see all colors with the same probability and above one of them dominates. Uh, there's another thing that you could do is you could look at these uh, simulations. So you could, for example, if I go below here, like at 3.7 or something like this, right? Um, I pause this simulation. Uh, can I pause this? Well, I've lost the cursor. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, now, you know, you see these chunks that have sort of different colors. Um, and you see that, in some sense, the chunks have a relatively well-defined size, right? They're all about the same size. And so, of course, the size is random, but that means that the random distribution is actually really well localized. So it has somehow exponentially decaying tails. Uh, and so you can ask yourself, you know, is that always true? You know, it might be that at some point, even though it localizes, it might not be so well localized and so on. Uh, and it's, you know, quite difficult to extract that kind of uh, information from these models, and that was one of the uh, uh, very nice results that uh, Dominique Copin, Raoufi, and Tassion obtained, which was that actually, as long as you're away from this critical value, um, the correlations always decay exponentially, which means that you, know, you see what we saw on the simulation, right? So how these clusters have really a well-defined size, okay? Um, so I think that brings me 
to the uh, end of my presentation, of course, I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you, Martin. Um, so next we will have the video, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, on Jun Ha and the Laudatio by Gil Kalai. Right, so let's get the video going. Mathematics, you want to know what is true and why it's true. It's often hard to go straight from where you are to where you want to go. Each one of us has to find our own way. The boundary between knowing and not knowing is so clear in mathematics. You can almost see this mysterious region that our brain secretly operates. If you think about something long enough, you cross that line of understanding. When I was young, math was like a faraway land surrounded by giant walls that I could not climb. I grew up in Korea and I dreamed of becoming a poet to express the inexpressible. I eventually learned that mathematics is a way of doing that. And now I am a professor of mathematics at Princeton University. I do research in combinatorics. My way was to build spaces from combinatorial objects. Once you have a space to move around, you can use your geometric intuition to extract information hidden in the original combinatorial structure. A good example of my work is the proof of the Dowling-Wilson conjecture. It's an old question, and the easiest special case of it is the following problem in plane geometry. Take a finite set of points on a plane and connect every pair of points by a line. Do we always get at least as many lines as points? Dowling and Wilson predicted that the answer is yes for points in an arbitrary dimension. Comparing the number of planes of a given dimension with that of a complementary dimension connected by a part of the initial point set. The conjecture can be formulated purely in the realm of discrete mathematics, but it's hard to prove within that same realm. So my collaborators and I imagined a space whose geometry untangles that difficulty. This imagined space has properties that are very similar to spaces that are familiar and more visible to us. And those properties allowed us to answer the original question using a totally different type of intuition. This is what happened in the case of Rhoda's conjecture and Dowling-Wilson's conjecture and, to a large extent, Mason's conjecture. I construct and analyze and wander in the geometric realm of my imagination. And when it becomes three o'clock, I go to pick up my kids from the elementary school. It really wakes me up. My wife, Nayoung, is the most important person in my life. She's my friend and 
companion and sometimes a teacher. She is always there for us. My older son Dan, we do a little bit of math together. Is it 30? Yep. Uh, can I turn it here? No! You are not done yet. He enjoys posing problems and watching other people solve them. It's like a puzzle and there is great joy in it. High five. Okay. <laughs> My younger son, Saul, he just started walking. After dinner, we change into our pajamas and go to bed. And then we repeat the whole thing. There is beauty in this repetition. We are truly very lucky. Princeton is one of the best towns in the world to be a mathematician and it's a peaceful place to raise our children. Every one of my works could not have been done without the help and influence of my collaborators. Being a part of a giant network of very good people gives me the freedom that I could not imagine before I became a mathematician. On clear days, I can see that I'm a small and simple part of a big and complex ancient structure. In some mysterious way, we are connected to each other, and we grow from that connection. And so uh, now we have Gil Kalai, who will from the Hebrew University, who will now do the Ladbats. Thank you. So do I have do I have the presentation? Oh yeah. Uh, so it's really an exciting day. I'm very happy to be here. Congratulations to all the prize winners and to all of us. And uh, it's a great honor to talk about the work of uh, Jun Ha. Uh, let's see what happened. No. How do you move to the next one? The green big one. Ah, sorry. No. So uh, here is the short citation for Jun Ha. Jun Ha is awarded the Fields Medal 2022 for bringing the ideas of Hodge theory to combinatorics the proof of the Dowling-Wilson conjecture for geometric lattices, the proof of the Heron-Rota-Welsh conjecture for metroids, the development of the theory of Lorentzian polynomials, and the proof of the strong Mason conjecture. So I, <coughs> I will try to explain to you some of these notions. I can approach any one of you who had some difficulties. Uh, so let me start with graph coloring. A proper coloring of a graph G is the coloring of the vertices of G, so that every two adjacent vertices are colored with different colors. And there is a famous problem, famous theorem, the four-color theorem, conjectured by Guthrie in 1852, proved by Apple and Hacken in 1976, is that every planar graph can be properly colored with four colors. Now comes a chromatic polynomial. Let G be a graph. Chi G of K is the number of proper coloring of G with K colors. So this is a, a function, uh, a, and chi, chi, chi G of K is called the chromatic polynomial of the graph G. Uh, it's not completely obvious that it's polynomial, but the, this follows from the following important contraction deletion relation, which associates the chromatic, the number of coloring for a graph G with the number of coloring with two other graphs, one where you delete a certain edge and one where you contract the same edge. And uh, the chromatic polynomial were uh, uh, considered first by George Birkhoff in 1912, and then uh, by Hustler Whitney and William Tatt, who also extend them to the Tatt polynomial and the, the tatt grotendieck invariant. And here is a nice little result by Stanley from 73. If you substitute 
minus one in this, uh, poly in this polynomial, you get the number of a cyclic orientation of G. And in 1968, Reed made the following conjecture that was uh, solved by Jun Ha in 2009. Suppose that the chromatic polynomial equals the a n of x to the n minus a n minus one x to the n minus one and so on. So the sign of the coefficients are alternating and read conjecture that the sequence of coefficients is unimodal. Unimodal means that it's go up and then it go down. And this was proved uh, by Jun Ha in 2009. And I, I in, in his proof, let me tell you, in his proof, Jun Ha related the coefficient of the chromatic polynomial to the Milner numbers of a complex hyperplane arrangement associated with the graph G. So this was a very startling connection between algebraic geometry and combinatorics. And I, I first heard about uh, Ha's startling proof of the Reed conjecture from a 2011 paper by uh, Yezhi Matushek who regarded this result, among few other results, as the beginning of a new algebraic era in discrete geometry. And, and he wrote, to me, 2010 looks as the anus mirabilis, a miraculous year in several areas of, mathemati of my mathematical interest. And now let me uh, move on to a more general conjecture, the heron rota welsh conjecture. And this asserts that if you consider the characteristic polynomial of a metroid, then the sequence of coefficient, coefficient uh, is log concave. Log concave means that a k square is greater or equal to a k minus one times a k plus one. The important thing to, to know is that being log concave is stronger than being unimodal. And uh, this conjecture is now a theorem for and I, I will explain the term in, in a minute, but for representable matroids over zero characteristic, this is the result of John ha, Jun ha from 2009. And for representable matroids over arbitrary characteristic, this was achieved by Ha and Eric Katz in 2010. And the full conjecture was proved by Karima Di Prasito, Jun Ha, and Eric Katz in 2015. And I have to tell you what is a matroid. Uh, which uh, a metroid is uh, an abstract mathematical object that ex extends the notion of sets of points in vector space. So this is an abstraction of the notion of linear independence. They were dis uh, first uh, discovered by Hustler Whitney in, in 1935 and also by Takeo Nakasawa around the same time. So if we have a set of points in some vector space V, we can consider the set of linearly independent subsets of this point, the set of bases, which are maximal uh, independent set, the set of flats, which are subsets that are close undertaking linear combination, and the uh, uh, also, we can consider the rank function that's associated to a subset, the dimension of the vector space spanned by it, and metroids can be defined by abstract properties of any of these notions. And this is a very uh, beautiful abstract theory, and uh, they also give an abstraction of the notion of graphs. So characteristic polynomials of metroid extend the notion of a uh, chromatic polynomial of a graph. So the result uh, from 2009 of Jun Ha uh, automatically imply the result for graphs. And here are, here are three examples of metroid. So metroid theory is a tri triumph both in the pursuit of abstraction, which is one thing that uh, we mathematicians do, but also for concrete simple examples. So here on the left, you can see the Fano metroid, which uh, is representable over fields of characteristic two, but not over other fields. On the right, you can see the non papus matroid. So this is a matroid with only nine points where we force the classical, the ancient theorem of papus not to hold, and therefore it cannot be represented over any matroid. And in the middle, there is another famous matroid called the Vamos matroid. And now, and now I want to tell you about hot theory, uh, and I'll tell you uh, very briefly, but uh, uh, Homology of algebraic variety satisfies three. So uh, we have homology. This is a graded uh, sequence of, of uh, subspace. And this has two, uh, three major uh, properties, the Poincaré duality, the hard Lifshitz theorem, and the Hodge-Riemann relations. So Poincaré duality tells you that the 
a dimension in degree i is equal to the dimension in degree d minus i. The hard lift theorem tells you that there is certain maps from, from degree i to degree i plus one that if you compose them all the way from degree i to degree d minus i, you get a non-singular map. And the Hodge-Riemann relation tells you that this non-singular map is actually definite. You can actually tell the characteristic. And those are uh, very important uh, properties. Uh, they are referred to as the standard conjecture or Gottendieck standard conjecture. And they were a combinatorial application of the hard lifted theorem that were pioneered by Richard Selly in 1980 and were later refined and studied by many people. And the, the result by uh, Hein Katz for low concavity for arbitrary characteristic uh, uses Hodge theory and these standard conjectures for an, an object which is called the wonderful comp uh, compactification by De Concini and Procesi and for complements of hyperplane arrangement. So th they, they build a very nice geometric variety, compact variety from complex hyperplane of arrangement, and uh, if you use the standard conjecture, you can, by a sequence of, of steps that I will not elaborate, get uh, the conjecture. But then uh, we, need, we had the challenge is to find homology for varieties that no, don't even exist. And uh, the first step is to replace the wonderful compactification by some algebraic object which was uh, introduced by Feichner and Yuzvinsky 2004, but then the main problem was to prove the standard conjecture for this object. And the proof is a tour de force, the argument is inductive, a, a very, it's a very big overview is that it's inductive based on some operation called flips, and I will not get uh, to it more, but I want to move to uh, to point in line, and this, this, uh, this comes close to the video we have seen. If you have endpoints in this space that linearly span the space, and you denote by WK the number of k-dimensional linear subspace determined by A, then uh, Motskin proved that W1 is less or equal to WD minus 1, and uh, Green proved uh, actually that there is some, Curtis Green, there's some relation, some injection that, that uh, is a strong form of this result. And for D equals 3, this is the result we, we, we saw in the video. Endpoints in the plane determine at least N lines. This is a result by uh, uh, De Bruyne and Erdes. And, and I, I really wanted to squeeze a, a proof of this result, or even two proofs, but it's, it's impossible. I, 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 I will do it some other time, but there are very short proofs, and you, you would enjoy them. In any case, the Dolling Wilson conjecture asserts that we have similar relation between the k-dimensional flats and the d-minus k-dimensional flats, and again, following by a strong combinatorial map that is even uh, stronger. And this was proved for representable Metroid by Jun Ha and Wang, and the general case by Braden, Ha, Masern, Proudfoot and Wang. And uh, here you don't have to use ordinary homology, but you have to use the so-called intersection homology. So this adds another uh, uh, difficulty to the situation where in the 2017 result you can use uh, real varieties, and in the 2020 result you have to invent varieties that do not exist. Homology of varieties that do not exist. And uh, I, I mentioned briefly the strong Mason conjecture. It comes in three strengths, the regular strength, the strong, and the ultra strong. And these are conjectures about the independence number of metroids. I will not get into that. I'll just say to you that all these conjectures are now theorems. And now there is even a competition between hot theory and between pure combinatorial reasoning. So I just want to conclude with application and connection. And one application by Branden and Ha is to use the, this theory for correlation inequalities for the POTS model that we just heard in the first lecture. So this may be a, another tool that we will be able to use in the decades to come uh, in uh, mathematical uh, uh, physics. And I want to mention another application uh, to the to a very beautiful conjecture by, the, by uh, Mihail and Vazirani, and this is a result by Anari, uh, Oveis, Gahan, and, and Vincent that used the, 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 the Rota-Heron-Welsh conjecture to prove expansion properties 
of a graph which represents the basis of metroids, uh, and this gives you an efficient probabilistic algorithm to count the number of bases of a metroid. This was a major open problem from the 90s. And uh, I would like to, to thank you, Jun Ha, for your wonderful contributions to mathematics, and to thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Uh, so now uh, we turn to the video for James Maynard, and uh, then there will be a laudatio by uh, Kanan Sandararajan, more easily known as Sound. Uh, so I, uh, let's turn to the video on James Maynard. The real world is exceptionally complicated and so I find myself visually always trying to find order within an otherwise chaotic object. When I look at a scene, I like to see the lines and structure of the fundamental objects of a scene. So there are lots of complicated moving objects in any real world scene, but those are somehow temporary objects which can move around and aren't the fundamental essence of what I'm looking at. I travel quite a bit to conferences as a mathematician. One way that I particularly enjoy interacting with the different fascinating cities that I see is through photography. I'm continually trying to separate out structured symmetric components from random chaotic background components. It's very similar in my mathematical work I'm often dealing with very complicated theoretical mathematical objects, but I'm trying to abstract out and see the underlying structure and separate this structure in the mathematical objects from the complicating noise that isn't so important. To me, prime numbers are these really amazing, fascinating objects. They're fundamental building blocks of the whole numbers, which are the most natural and basic objects in the universe. If you think about how chemicals are built up of atoms, you can visualize the primes being the individual atoms connected together to give the whole number. So for example, you can visualize 12 as a chemical with the atoms 2 times 2 times 3 connected together to make the whole number. So one problem that I've been interested in almost my entire mathematical career has been on the gaps between primes. As you look at prime numbers on the number line, they gradually become sparse and sparser and more and more spread out, which means that the typical size of the gap grows as you look at bigger and bigger numbers. In work with collaborators, we've shown the existence of clusters of many primes all coming very close together on the number line, and separately shown the existence of gaps which are unusually far apart. One other aspect of my work has been questions to do with Diophantine approximation. Trying to understand real numbers by approximating them with fractions. For example, the famous number pi is often written as 3.14, which is 314 over 100, or you can approximate it as, say, 22 over 7. And it turns out that fraction is actually closer to pi and so, in some ways, is a more efficient approximation. These efficient approximations encode a lot of mathematical content about the original numbers that you are studying. A major focus of my research is developing new mathematical tools for trying to understand prime numbers. They remain very mysterious and poorly understood, despite mathematicians intensively studying them for thousands of years. To even have a hope of trying to understand them seems to require this very deep and powerful mathematical insight and tantalizingly it always feels slightly out of reach of current techniques. 
I've been with my partner Ellie for a bit over 10 years now. She's a doctor who works in the hospital in Oxford. Ellie might talk about things to do with medicine and the hospital and talk about, I don't know, like the complications of a particular medication. And I really want to know what sort of numbers we're talking about. So she might say, oh, this is a pretty rare number, but I find it super useful to just have some, it's definitely more than this and it's definitely less than this. Ellie and I are expecting our first baby. I'm naturally someone who likes to really understand things and plan things and make sure I'm in control of things as much as possible. Having a child is certainly going to force me to embrace a certain amount of uncertainty. I'm super excited about having a kid. I guess I would be hopeful that I can happily merge together my current fairly mathematical life with the new family life that will be a very important part of me in six months' time. Other mathematicians who've become fathers have told me that they've been able to do it, so I hope I can do it too. So uh, here we have sound from Stanford University who will give them a laudatio. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a delight to give this uh, laudation on the work of James Maynard. As we've heard, Maynard has proved uh, some very beautiful results, uh, some real spectacular breakthroughs in prime number theory, and also recently on Diophantine approximation, where he settled with Kukulopoulos, an 80-year-old problem due to Duffin and Schaefer. I won't be able to tell you all of his results, so I'll try to focus on a couple of uh, the most spectacular ones and to give some idea of the context between, behind these results. So, we, also, we already saw in this video of uh, Maynard's result on gaps between primes, so I want to describe that uh, more formally. This is perhaps the greatest achievement so far uh, by James. So, the result says that you can find bounded intervals that contain as many primes as you want. So, if you want uh, to find a thousand primes, there is some constant C of 1,000, and in intervals of length, this constant interval of this constant size, you can find 1,000 primes. Now, to appreciate this result, I have to tell you what was known about it before, and I'll do that in, a, in just a little bit. Let me tell you also another result which is very, very striking and very easy to explain. Uh, this result says that there are infinitely many primes that have no seven in their decimal expansion. Well, seven is not special. You can pick any other digit that you want, and it, doesn't, it can miss that digit. But interestingly enough, the first few digits of pi are a prime, and they miss the digit seven. So there are lots of primes of this type. I, I put this in as just a striking result. I won't really talk much more about it. But just to say where this fits in, the idea, there's a large class of questions that have to deal, that deal with finding primes in sparse sequences. And the set of numbers up to x that miss a 7 in them is, a, is such a set. The number of these up to x is x to some power that's less than 1. And to prove that there are primes in such sequences is a very difficult proposition. And Maynard's result here, even though it looks like a piece of recreational mathematics, is one of the very few handful of results that we have that produce primes in such sparse sequences. <coughs> So let me spend more time talking about uh, the, the big result on bounded gaps between prime numbers and producing many primes and bounded intervals. So the underlying motivation for many of these questions and what is maybe the most central problem in prime number theory uh, is the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture. And what this aims to do, this is a big generalization of problems like twin primes, of showing that there are primes P such that P plus 2 is also a prime. 
And the Hardy Littlewood conjecture in general asks, if you are given a set of k numbers h1 to hk, can you make n plus h1, n plus h2 up to n plus hk, all of them to be prime? Now, we know the number of primes up to, up, up to a given number n is about n in log n. So we should expect to find many such, uh, many such values of n for which all these numbers are simultaneously prime. We should expect to maybe find uh, n over log n to the k. Each number has a one in log n chance of being prime, so we might expect to find n over log n to the k such tuples. This is not exactly correct because if I had the tuple n and n plus one being prime, then I could not expect to find many primes of this type because one of them would have to be even and therefore not prime. So Hardy and Littlewood understood that to, mo to get a reasonable conjecture, you have to modify this random guess of n over log n by a constant which is known as the singular series, although it's given here as a product. And what this singular series measures is that it uh, tells you how this tuple differs from a set of random k, set of k numbers. So you form a product of looking at the number of elements in your set mod p, and you have this fudge factor. Usually the number of elements mod p, if p is sufficiently large, is k. So this will be a convergent product. It really depends only on the first few primes, whether this number, uh, what this number looks like, whether it's zero or not. And then you have a plausible conjecture for the number of prime k tuples. So this conjecture is plausible because if you plug in your set to be 0 and 1 so that you're asking for n and n plus 1 to be prime, we should expect no such, no such primes of this form apart from 2 and 3. And the Hardy-Littlewood constant, the singular series of 0 and 1 will be 0. Similarly, if you ask for n, n plus 2, n plus 4 to be prime, one of the three will have to be a multiple of 3, and the Hardy-Littlewood constant is once again 0. If you take more interesting examples like twin primes, the Hardy-Littlewood constant will be 1.32. So you expect to find more than the random number of twin primes uh, than just any two numbers being prime. Of course, we, even though we expect there to be more twin primes than you would expect, we still can't prove that there are infinitely many of these twin primes. In general, the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture makes it very easy to understand when you should get infinitely many uh, tuples of primes. And the idea is that there should be, just as we see in this example of n, n plus 1, or n, n plus 2, and n plus 4, there must be no single prime like 2 or 3 that, divides one, that is forced to divide one of these numbers. So if that's true, then we get, in, we get lots of tuples with, uh, that are all primes. And this would prove the theorem that I told you, that there are arbitrarily many primes that you want in bounded intervals. You can just write down one of these k-tuples, and you would get all of them to be prime. Of course, the problem is that we don't know a single instance of a non-trivial case of the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture, which has been proved. The Hardy-Littlewood conjecture would also prove for you immediately another great theorem about primes, the Green-Tau theorem. So you can see that this is an admissible tuple of six, uh, six numbers. And so you can check that there will be infinitely many primes, or the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture would tell you that there are infinitely many primes, six primes in an arithmetic progression where the common difference is just 30. We do know that there are six primes in an arithmetic progression by the Green-Tau theorem, but not with the given difference like here. So these conjectures seemed completely out of reach, and they are still a little bit out of reach for a long time. Uh, and uh, to illustrate how far they were out of reach, I will tell you some even simpler conjectures which were out of reach. So the gaps between primes keep growing because there are only n over log n primes up to n. So you can ask, how do the spacings of these consecutive gaps behave? So if you ask for the spacing to lie in some interval from alpha to beta, we expect that these behave like random numbers, so it converges to a Poisson process. Now, this conjecture, which is also implied by the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture, so it's strictly weaker than the Hardy-Littlewood conjecture, but this is already a completely open conjecture still. I can weaken it even further by saying 
if I look at these normalized spacings, can I just say that, they, that the limit points of the set that I can get close to any non-negative real number at all? And that also is a wide open problem. The only limit point that we knew for a long time was that you can make large gaps between prime numbers, so infinity is a limit point, but we didn't know that there were any small gaps between prime numbers, whether zero is a limit point. And that situation changed about 20 years back with the work of uh, Goldstone, Pince, and Yildirim, who first showed that there are small gaps between prime numbers. So they showed that there are uh, lots of primes where the, the gap from one prime to the next is very small in comparison to the average spacing. This is not a bounded gap between primes, but it's kind of getting, was the first step towards that. One key input in the work of Goldson, Pins, and Ildrum is uh, an understanding of the distribution of primes and arithmetic progressions. So if you pick an arithmetic progression A mod Q, you expect the primes to be evenly distributed in these progressions so long as A and Q have no common factor so that they are allowed to be primes in this progression. And if we can understand the, the distribution of primes and progressions up to some uh, level of distribution, then we could use that method to, along with a, with a large body of work called SIF theory, to try to understand uh, these spacings between primes. Now, Goldson, Prince, and Ildrim realized that if you could extend the level of distribution of primes and progressions, then you would be able to produce bounded gaps between primes. But this was a, a very important open problem. It goes in certain ways beyond the Riemann hypothesis uh, in terms of the kind of information that it, uh, that it, that it communicates. And uh, a remarkable advance was made in 2013 by the work of uh, Yitang Zhang, who was previously unknown, and he came uh, completely out of the blue. He could prove more uh, a version of the bombier rivenegradov theorem going slightly beyond x to the half, and this enabled him to show that there are bounded gaps between primes for the first time. And uh, he showed that if you take more than 3.5 million tuple, and the hardy little conjecture tells you that you can make all of them primes, and he showed that you can make two of them primes infinitely often. And in this way, he showed that the gaps between primes are infinitely often less than 70 million. So this was a big breakthrough, but it did not give any hope of showing that there were three primes in a bounded interval, for example. So the next case already was open. But very shortly after this paper came out in 2013, within a few months, Maynard, uh, in a memorable conference in Oberwolfach, announced a proof that there are arbitrarily many primes in bounded intervals. And he did this by a refinement of the goldston pins ildrim sieve weights, a certain multidimensional version of these sieve weights. And as uh, luck would have it, this was also found independently by Terry Tao around the same time, these weights. So what, uh, what the result really says is that if you take any given number m, you can find the k sufficiently large in terms of m such that any k-tuple, which is supposed to contain k primes by the holly littlewood conjectures, well, we can't prove that it contains all, all, we can't make all of them be prime, but we can make at least m of them be prime. There were two great uh, things achieved at this theorem. The first one was that you could find more than just two primes in bounded intervals, which was not possible by the methods of uh, Goldson, Pins, and Ildrum, and Zhang. And then secondly, very surprisingly, you didn't actually need Zhang's theorem of going beyond x to the half in order to reach this. In fact, the classical bombier rivenegrov theorem, or even a very weak version of that, would have been enough. So these weights came as a, as a revelation, and they've led to many further breakthroughs. So after, this, uh, after the work, there's, uh, uh, the Polymath project worked on optimizing the dependence between k and m. And so, for example, for finding two primes, you can find uh, the gap between consecutive primes less than 246. It's not quite two, but it's not so bad either. And if you assume certain conjectures on the distribution of primes and progressions, you can make the gap 
at most six, you can make two of the, of the three numbers, n, n plus two, n plus six, prime infinitely often. The Maynard tau weights have also had many, many other applications in prime number theory. I'll give you two more of these. So I've been talking about finding small gaps between primes, but somewhat unexpectedly, they also led to breakthroughs in finding large gaps between primes. This is the uh, finding a normalized spacing, which is arbitrarily large in compared to the usual spacing of log x. So this is a kind of typical thing that you might expect to see in an analytic number theory paper. So this is the result from the 1930s by Erdős and Rankin. But uh, it, it goes to infinity very, very slowly. But a famous problem of Erdős, the problem for which we, he offered the most uh, cash prize, was to replace this constant c by anything going to infinity. So th there was no progress on this, or very little progress on this for uh, more than 80 years. And then rather s uh, astonishingly, in 2014, just before the, the ICM in 2014, uh, there was a resolution of this problem of Erdős almost simultaneously by two groups, by Maynard using his uh, sieve weights, and independently by Ford Green, Konyagin, and Tau. So they joined forces. It's Maynard's approach, which was better suited for quantification. And now this remains the best result that we know on gaps between primes. So the difference between this and the earlier result is that you can see the square in the denominator has become a power one. So one other application of, this, uh, of these sieve weights is that I told you that uh, these limit points of the consecutive spacings, all non-negative real numbers must be limit points. We still don't know that. We now know that zero is a limit point and infinity is a limit point, but no other limit point is known. But we can at least say that one of e pi or pi minus e must be a limit point. And this follows from a beautiful result which uh, by Merikowski, adapting work, earlier work of Banks, Freiburg, and, uh, and Maynard, if you take any four numbers, beta one to beta four, then some difference of them must be a limit point of the set of consecutive spacings. So if you start with zero, e pi, e plus pi, then you get this, con this uh, consequence. So these are some of the achievements of Maynard in prime number theory. There are many more results besides, uh, but I won't uh, have a chance to talk about them. Let me end by telling you very briefly the result on Diffontine approximation that was also mentioned in the video. This has to do with uh, approximating irrational numbers alpha. You can imagine that the irrational number alpha is just between zero and one because we're trying to approximate it by fractions A over Q and how well these approximations can be. So we, all, we know already from Dirichlet from, an, from the pigeonhole principle that it can be less than one over Q squared infinitely often. And if you take a number like pi, it's very hard to understand what kind of Diffontine approximations are possible for pi or not possible for pi. So the metric theory of Diffontine approximation asks not what happens for every given number alpha, but for most alpha, for the measure of the alpha for which you have either a very good Diffontine approximation or you don't have a very good Diffontine approximation. So the central result in this, uh, in this area, or the central problem in this area, was a conjecture of Duffin and Schaefer from the 40s, which gave a very nice dichotomy of when you expect to have very good Diffontine approximations and when you don't expect to have very good Diffontine approximations. So if the sum, this is the Euler fee function phi of q, if the sum of phi of q times the constraint that we are imposing, if that sum converges, it's very easy to show that the set of alpha for which uh, there exists such Diffontine approximations or infinitely many such Diffontine approximations has measure zero. The, the, the opposite, the converse of it, that if the sum diverges, then the measure is one, is the difficult part of the duffin schaefer conjecture. And this was proved in a spectacular fashion very recently by work of Kukulopoulos and Maynard. I, uh, have just stated this result here, 
but Dimitris Kuklopoulos will be giving a talk about this later this week in the ICM, and I can refer you to his talk for more details on that. So this is a very small sampling of some of uh, James Maynard's uh, most impressive achievements. And again, these are only the achievements to date, and uh, we fully expect to have many more. So congratulations to James again, and with best wishes for me. sound. Uh, we will now have the video of Marina Vyazovska and the Laudatio by Henry Cohn from Microsoft and MIT. So let's see the video. Nothing in life comes for free. We are all very adaptable, we can manage a lot, but it all somehow has its price. I am from Kiev, Ukraine, and in February my life changed forever. And not only for me, but for everyone in the world, and especially the people in my country. Whenever we have something good in our life, often we take that for granted. And peaceful, is what I always took for granted. Now I understand how wrong I was about that. I'm a professor of mathematics at EPFE, Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. I'm a chair of number theory. What we are doing, of course, it's shaping the future, but maybe it will be used in a hundred years from now, but it's still important. What we like about students is that they are young, they are still enthusiastic, they have a lot of energy and they believe in what is ahead of them. So I can tell them what my opinion is and a student would say like, no, a professor does not know what, <laughs> what she's talking about. So maybe one advice for PhD students is to, okay, at least give your advice or this privilege of a doubt. And I think this is advice which is good both for professors and for students. I work on geometric optimization problems. So sphere packing, it's a very natural geometric problem. You have a big box and you have an infinite collection of equal balls and you're trying to put as many balls into the box as you can. Legend is that people were interested in this, how many cannon balls can they pack into the ship? So the answer for the cannonballs is, as you see in a supermarket, the orange is stuck in this pyramidal shape. So essentially this is the best possible packing. But now we could also go to other dimensions. And maybe here it's a time to explain what are other dimensions. If we are on a plane, we would need only two coordinates to describe every point. And on the line we need one number. But if we are moving in a three-dimensional space, we need three coordinates to describe every point, like GPS coordinates. But as mathematicians, we can go farther. Nothing stops us for introducing one more coordinate or 24 different coordinates. For many years, people thought about this fair packing problem and developed many methods how to address it. Either you have to construct some object which is optimal, or you have to show that nothing better can be done. So in each dimension they found some bound. Uh, however, in dimensions 8 and 24, the bound came very, very close to the actual density of uh, known packings. E8 packing in dimension 8 and bleach lattice in dimension 24. So they realized there exists this magic function, which is supposed to actually prove the optimality of packing. My contribution was to give an explicit formula for the magic function. And this is what took from 2003 to 2016, like 13 years to find. My parents and my two sisters normally live in Kiev. 
So when the war started, I could not think about anything else, including mathematics. During those first days, I realized how much I love teaching, because on the very first day, I had my first class here in the PFL. Of course, when I'm in front of class, I have to forget about everything else, because I have to be very focused. This made me to forget about this fear and pain inside myself. Recently, I dedicated a lecture to Yulia Zdanowska, a young mathematician and computer scientist from Kharkiv. My teachers from Kyiv University were also her teachers. Uh, Julia was a person filled with light. And her big dream was teaching mathematics to kids in Ukraine. During the first days of war, she was killed in a missile attack on Kharkiv. When young people die, you think, okay, so what's the point of my work as teacher if young, talented people are just wasted in this terrible war? When someone like her dies, it's like the future dies. Right now, Ukrainians are really paying the highest price for our beliefs and for our freedom. I'm very happy that my sister Tanya and Natasha evacuated from Kyiv and are staying with my family as the war continues. Tanya has to separate with her husband, and I know it is extremely difficult for her. Uh, my niece and my nephew miss their dad a lot. Uh, they understand what is happening now in, in Ukraine, and it is a lot to process for them. My husband, Daniel, is a physicist at the PFL. Daniel has a passion for photography. Thanks to his pictures, we have a wonderful way to remember important and happy moments of our lives. The thing I like about Kyiv the most are the green parks and quiet places and the ancient churches. I understand that now there will be marks of war there, and this is a scary thought. But Kyiv is one of the eternal cities. One day soon, I hope to return. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, so we will continue with uh, Laudatio by Henry Cole from Microsoft and MIT. Okay, thanks. I'm really happy to be here celebrating the work of Marina and the other fields medalists. In particular, what you heard in the video is that Marina was awarded the Fields Medal for determining the densest sphere packing in eight dimensions. This is a really remarkable piece of work. What I'll do today is not get into any of the technical details. You can look at the written version of the laudation for that. But I'd like to explain to you some of the story and ideas behind it, and at least show you a few pictures. So, uh, I guess this is somewhat redundant given the video, but uh, Marina is a professor at EPFL and uh, she's done great work in a lot of different areas. I'll focus on this one theorem just because it's so striking, but of course it's just one part of a much larger body of work. So, I first became aware of this paper on March 14th, 2016, when Marina posted it to the archive. I'd known of a number of other papers of hers earlier than this, but I hadn't realized she was working on this problem. And basically, as soon as this paper became available, everybody was astonished by it. I've put up a few quotes here, quotes from Peter Sarnak, who said, it's stunningly simple, as all great things are. You just start reading the paper and you know this is correct. 
And from Tom Hales, I felt that it would take a Ramanujan to find it. These are quotes that uh, they made to reporters at the time. And I've also quoted from an email Akshay Venkatesh sent me that night. Wow, how on earth did they find this function? Marina had pulled off something really miraculous here. So what's the context? The context here is the sphere packing problem. We've got a bunch of identical balls. We want to cram them into space as densely as we can without letting them overlap. In other words, so we maximize the density, the fraction of space covered by them. And of course, we all know how to do this in three dimensions. In three dimensions, there's nothing surprising about the answer. You know, It's what you see in any grocery store. On the other hand, it's not so easy to prove. So being mathematicians, we can do this in any dimension we want. Of course, in one dimension, it's not very interesting. You've got the interval packing problem on the line, and it's trivial. In two dimensions, the answer is a little bit prettier. You have this hexagonal packing with six disks surrounding each one. It's not so easy to prove that this is optimal, but it's not so hard either. Tue did it in the late 19th century. And finally, in three dimensions, it's easy to guess the answer, but this wasn't proved until a spectacular work by Tom Hales, where he combined massive computer calculations together with ingenious human arguments spanning hundreds of pages. It all worked. On the other hand, this kind of looks like a parody of pure mathematics, looking at problems where we all know what the answer is, but going to really great lengths to prove it. Instead, what happens in high, higher dimensions is totally different. And one thing I want to emphasize that I won't have time to go into here is that higher dimensions actually matter here. So for example, these problems come up naturally in information theory. Sphere packings turn out to be error correcting codes for a continuous communication channel. So this isn't just a sort of pretty abstract problem. It's that, but it's also something much broader in mathematics. So above three dimensions, the answer is only known in two cases. First of all, there's Marina's miraculous theorem in eight dimensions, and then several of us worked with her to extend it to 24 dimensions using the same ideas that she introduced in her eight-dimensional paper. And these are the only cases that are known above three dimensions. And I find this really remarkable. The thing is, how is it possible that we understand one, two, three dimensions, we understand eight dimensions thanks to Marina's work, but four through seven are still a mystery? I can't say I'll give you a compelling answer to that. I think it's still something of a mystery, but we'll at least take a look at what happens and how some dimensions can be miraculous. So what I'd like to emphasize here is that high dimensions don't behave anything like you might expect from low dimensions. In low dimensions, the impression you get is it's easy to guess the answer. In high dimensions, it turns out to be very difficult to guess the answer. In fact, aside from a handful of cases, we don't even have a conjecture for what the optimal packing is. And in particular, just about any approach that you might take to guess an answer fails. So for example, in low dimensions, you can always get the packing in any given dimension by stacking packings in lower dimensions nestled next to each other. That's not true in higher dimensions. We've got upper and lower bounds for the density, but they're exponentially far apart. So for example, in 36 dimensions, the best we know how to prove is that if you take the densest packing anyone knows, you remove the spheres, you can't put in any more than 52 times as many spheres as you took out. And that's kind of ridiculous. It's this horrific gap in our knowledge, almost embarrassing for humanity. So given how poor our understanding is in most dimensions, it's really miraculous that Marina was able to get this exactly. 
So here I've uh, put a plot of the best density known, this blue curve. You can see it's kind of jagged and unpredictable. And the best upper bound known, the red curve. And I've highlighted the two cases where they match. So something really miraculous is happening in these dimensions that just doesn't seem to happen anywhere else. In particular, each of them has a really wonderful packing. The E8 root lattice in eight dimensions and the leech lattice in 24 dimensions. And these are wonderful exceptional objects in mathematics. They're connected to all sorts of things in many different areas of mathematics. They're miraculously dense and symmetrical. And they occur for seemingly sporadic reasons very closely tied to these particular dimensions. I wish I had a good way to visualize these. I've put a plot up here of a two-dimensional cross-section of E8. So a cross-section in two dimensions won't hit very many spheres, but this at least uses color to show the distance to the nearest sphere. And it's only a sort of pale shadow of what E8 actually looks like, but I can't visualize eight dimensions either, so I don't know what we can do about uh, seeing it. So E8, is, of course, a famous object across mathematics. It plays a fundamental role in Lie theory. It comes up in the theory of uh, polytopes via a tiling of space, a semi-regular tiling of space with polytopes. It plays an important role in the theory of lattices. This is a really marvelous mathematical object. So what happens here? So the setting for Marina's work is Noah Melkes and I had a technique for using functions satisfying certain properties to get sphere packing bounds. And in particular, this was based on the Fourier transform. So what we proved is, don't worry about the precise statement. If you have a function in n dimensions, and if it and its Fourier transform satisfy certain inequalities, you can deduce a sphere packing bound from this. So the good news is this gives you a systematic technique for making sphere packing bounds, namely find functions satisfying these inequalities. The bad news is it didn't tell us how to get functions satisfying the inequalities, at least ones that gave good sphere packing bounds, and it didn't tell us how to find the best functions. In general, this problem is still unsolved, the question of how do you optimize the sphere packing bound you get from this theorem. In fact, it's been solved only in one, eight, and 24 dimensions. But meanwhile, the plot I had earlier showing the upper bound is given by numerically optimizing this. Even if we don't know how to find the function exactly, we can at least try to approximate it with a computer. So one thing you can show is, if you want to get an exact bound, the function has to have certain properties. In particular, the function and its Fourier transform have to have certain roots. So for example, in eight dimensions, it turns out the function has to cross the axis at radius root two and has to have zeros at square roots of even integers. And the Fourier transform has to have the same zeros. So okay, that doesn't sound too bad. You look at this and say, well, just find the function and then collect the sphere packing bound. So I spent 17 years trying to find a function with these properties. I failed to find it. A lot of people worked on this and failed to find it. It wasn't until Marina that anyone had any idea how to produce a function like this. So the problem is, sure, you can get good numerical approximations, but how do you know these numerical approximations aren't misleading? You know, you can get something to a bunch of decimal places, yet nevertheless not get it exactly. The problem here is the Fourier transform. And this is connected with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you remember Heisenberg's uncertainty principle from physics about 
the inability to pin down the position and momentum of a particle. This really comes from the fact that the momentum wave function is the Fourier transform of the position wave function. And there are a lot of uncertainty principles in mathematics which basically say, in very loose terms, it's difficult to control f and f hat simultaneously. Of course, you can make f do whatever you want, but on the other hand, you're going to totally mess up f hat in the process, and vice versa. So the problem is, you could come pretty close to getting this, but the behavior we needed was just on the threshold of what's impossible. It was just saturating an uncertainty principle, and nobody had any idea how to actually produce such a thing. I counted, I thought about this for 6,282 days <laughs> before finally Marina solved this. So for a long time, everybody assumed the answer must have something to do with modular forms with sort of deep special functions that arise in number theory that are connected with lattices. And this is very reasonable because this felt like a deep unsolved problem. It was connected with lattices. Why shouldn't it involve modular forms? There's a problem though that if you've ever sort of looked at uh, a book on modular forms, you'll see that it's full of pictures like this, which looks nothing like that. So basically the problem is we had this stock of special functions that satisfied intricate, beautiful transformation laws, but they didn't look remotely like the functions that we wanted. And I tried various transformations to turn one into another. Various other mathematicians did. Some people proposed very clever transformations, but they didn't work. So finally, what Marina did was she found an amazing integral transform. So going back to Peter Sarnak's co comment from earlier, this was a very simple integral transform, but of course simple is not at all the same thing as easy. It was a very deep and miraculous integral transform. And then having found this transform, she then identified exactly the right modular forms. Oops, I've put some plots here these are sort of complex plots using color to denote complex phase. But basically, she found these intricate quasi-modular forms, which when you plug them into her integral transform, give you exactly the functions that you want. And I totally endorse Tom Hales's uh, comment that this is the sort of thing that Ramanujan uh, would have done. It's an incredible sort of piece of mathematical ingenuity of sort of manipulation of special functions. Part of what I love about it is it's fairly accessible, that there's some work by Fields Medalists where it's tremendously important, incredibly impressive, but also very technically forbidding, where occasionally I look at something and say, I wish I had more time to understand this. Marina's work, it's ingenious. It takes time to learn and understand, but it's more accessible than a lot of the mathematics that's out there. And I urge you to take a look at her paper, at some of the expositions on this, because it's just a marvelous piece of work. So in particular, she found this ingenious transformation, and once you have it, it just works, and it solves the entire problem. And like any wonderful piece of mathematics, the story doesn't end there. It turns out that these techniques tell you all sorts of amazing things about, for example, interpolation problems in higher dimensions. When can you combine partial information about a function at its Fourier transform to get a unique solution? And Marina will be giving a talk tomorrow, I believe, that will touch on things like this. So if you're interested in how this fits into a broader mathematical picture, be sure to attend her talk. So just to sort of finish up and summarize, what does this tell us about Marina? I think one thing I'm really impressed with is her boldness, that she took an incredibly challenging problem and worked on it for months, for years, trying various things until she found the right way to solve it. 
that she is a technical master of number theory and special functions, capable of doing really impressive things, but also she has creative ideas and draws everything together. And whenever you read a paper by Marina, it, you learn a new perspective that changes how you look at some part of mathematics. In any case, let me uh, wrap things up here since we're out of time, but I'd just like to congratulate Marina, first of all, for her magnificent mathematical accomplishments and for winning the Fields Medal. It's definitely very well deserved. Congratulations once again to all the medalists, and thank you for the nice laudations. Uh, next, we have a music performance. We have Erika Malisma on violin and Emil Holmström on piano. We will hear two pieces. First one is San Sibelius, Auf der Heide, Opus 115, number one, followed by Clara Schumann, Three Romances, Opus 22. Erika Malisma, yes, please, you can take your seats now. I should have said that, sorry. And you can stay on the stage, please. So Erika Malisma and Emil Holmström have worked and played together for, for a decade. Their repertoire ranges from Mozart to contemporary music. Both of them regularly commission and premiere new Finnish works. The duo Schumann recording, released in 2019, garnered much acclaim. Helsingin Sanomat gave the album five stars, and the Finnish broadcasting company Yle nominated it uh, the album of the year. It also won the 2019 Emma Award in Classical Music. They are also the co-founders of the Ristiveto, festival that concentrates on 19th century music on period instruments. They jointly organized the Klassinen Hietsu concert series in Helsinki. And I've come to learn that they are also close friends who try their best to share their ups and downs with one another with varying degrees of success. Please.
Thank you very much, Erika and Emil. Now it is time to move on to our next award for the young, the Abacus Medal. And I would like to invite Professor Koenig back to the stage. Very well. Uh, the IMU Abacus Medal is awarded once every four years for outstanding contributions in mathematical aspects of information science by persons under 40 years of age. This is the first year for this award, which is funded jointly by the University of Helsinki and the Simons Foundation. This award is a continuation of the Rolf Nevanlina Prize that was awarded from 1982 to 2018. The IMU Abacus Medal Committee was ch chosen by the IMU EC. It is chaired by James Demel from Berkeley, whose name was made public, and the remaining members of the committee, whose name was secret until now, are Annalisa Bufa, Mina Mahajan, Amit Singer, and Dan Spielman. I would like to thank them on behalf of the IMU for their hard work and their service to the community. I now call to the stage the representatives from the sponsors, uh, Vice Rector Tom Bolling from the University of Helsinki and Yuri Chinkel from the Simons Foundation.
Uh, and now to our uh, award winner, Mark Braverman from Princeton University is awarded the IMU Abacus Medal 2022 for his pathbreaking research developing the theory of information complexity, a framework for using information theory to reason about communication protocols. His work has led to direct sum theorems giving lower bounds on, on amortized communication, ingenious protocol compression methods, and new interactive communication protocols resilient to noise. So Mark. We will now show a video for the award, and then there will be a law day show introduced by Carlos Kenig again. If you take a list of open problems in math, let's say aliens kidnap planet Earth and tell mathematicians, okay, within a year you have to produce a solution. I'm not sure we would be able to. The difference between research math and other activities is that in research math you can be a genius 10% of the time and a full 90% of the time and life will be great. In most other activities, if you perform like that, you'll be fired or potentially worse. <laughs> I'm a professor in the Department of Computer Science at Princeton University. I am teaching mostly theoretical computer science here, and I've been here for just over 10 years. I've been married to my wife, Anna, for 14 years. She's a clinical psychologist. We have two kids. Eva is six, and Ellie is four. In my research, I'm working on developing theoretical computer science and connecting it to as many other areas of knowledge as possible. Communication complexity considers scenarios where there are two or more parties performing computation, and it is specifically concerned with the amount of communication they need to perform between them. I worked on introducing and developing tools from information theory to get new results in communication complexity and new techniques for proving precise estimates on the amount of communication needed. Here is an example of a data manipulation problem involving communication complexity, starring our two lovely children. Say there are two players. They are called Alice and Bob. Each has a bag of animals. The goal is to figure out if Alice and Bob have an animal in common or not, while communicating as little as possible. They could just start naming animals one by one, until all the animals have been named or until Alice and Bob discover that they have the same animal. This is actually suboptimal, you can do much better. The key is to break the communication into many little problems, asking, okay, do they have a hippo in common? Do they have a panda in common? And so on. Using information complexity, the most important part of this proof is to correctly define the quantity of information we are interested in, where less is better. The goal is to figure out the answer while each learns as little as possible from the other about what they have. Let's say that Alice and Bob are trying to decide if they both have a panda. One solution is for both Alice and Bob to yell panda or no panda. This can be improved. If Alice yells no panda, there is no reason for Bob to reveal that he has a panda and not some other animal. 
So we can have Alice say panda or no panda. And only if she says panda, then Bob chimes in. Panda. It turns out that you can do even better with more back and forth communication. We can calculate exactly the fractional number of bits we need in order to decide whether we have a panda in common or not. Then you take this fraction, multiply it by the number of decisions you need to make, and you have the answer. Within communication complexity with two parties, this worked out pretty nicely. And the current frontier is to see how much it can be extended past two parties, or if there is an actual stumbling block. One potential long-term goal for computational complexity theory, and it's not clear if it's even possible, is to come up with conservation laws for computation. For example, we know that you cannot power a city with one diesel generator, because of conservation of energy. You can compute how many watts you produce with a diesel generator, compute consumption, and see that it's not even on the same scale. Hence, it's impossible. We know that you cannot store the entire database of all the pictures on the internet on a smartphone by conservation laws from information theory. The basic unit now is bits instead of watts. A smartphone is capable of storing a certain number of bits. All the pictures on the internet take some number of bits that is much higher. It would be amazing if we had such conservation laws for computation. For instance, could you break cryptographic systems using a smartphone? You would hope that it would say something like you have to try all the keys, which is computationally demanding, so it will take a very, very long time on a small device. For this, you'd need some kind of a conservation law. To succeed, I think you need to surround yourself with people who can teach you a lot. And not just in terms of mathematics, but more generally to become a better person. Actually, I could imagine myself being happy not doing math. I think that makes me a better mathematician. And, and now we're going to have the Laudatio by Johan Hastad from KTH. Ears are not big enough. Is that okay? So you see Mark in front of you, and he's from Princeton University, and it's my job here to tell you a little bit about what he's done. And as you saw very nicely in his video, it's about information complexity, but that's only a small, small part of all, of all his contributions. But in fact, it's well, it might be the most entertaining part, so I will tell you mostly about this. Maybe I'll touch on some of his other work in circuit complexity later. And I'll, you know, lunch is getting close, you're all hungry. I'll try to be simple. I'll, um, I'll skip some things without really lying, I hope, and I'll forget some of the many people that also contributed to this and focus on the work of, of Mark. And I just want to say that this is really fundamental things. What I like at, lo at least a lot in this world is communication, you know, um, information, how to quantify it, computation, all these basic concepts. And Mark has really contributed greatly to this in a very fundamental way. And just to make sure that you're not worried about infinities, everything here will be finite. We'll have finite sequences of bits. We'll have sometimes finite sequences from larger alphabets, so you don't have to worry about infinities or anything. And as we saw in the video, we have two people co collaborating, and I found another, Alice and Bob, that marked it, and they share an input, and they want to do something. Okay, and I'll, this talk mostly computer function, but they might want to achieve something else, and they're sending things back and forth between them. And to be a little bit more formal, they each have an input, small a, small b. These are from a probability distribution that I'll call mu. And you should think of this as a joint probability distribution, so the two inputs are, are correlated. 
communication is easy to measure. We're sending bits or symbols, and we just count them. I'll get back to defining information very soon. And I just want to say that, well, we'll have a random variable, which is the outcome of this interaction, and I will call it pi, and it comes from a probability distribution, capital pi. Uh, just to get you in tune with uh, things and how I think about them, let's do a very simple problem, not pandas, but equalities of bit strings. So they each have a bit string of length n, and they want to check are these equal. Of course, this is a very simple solution. Alice just sends her entire input to Bob, and Bob says yes or no. And this, but this takes n bit, and this is sort of very bad in this situation. You can always send your entire input. But in fact, it's not too hard to see that you need n bits, and I, if you're still awake, you can convince yourself of this. Namely, look at all the executions where they have equal, equal inputs, you know, a, which I call a, a, and b, b. If any two such inputs leads to the same interaction, then you can cut this up to pieces and give A to A and B to B, and now they'll think they're different because they can't distinguish from the A, A, and B, B scenarios. So there's not much to say here. But what I want to convey here with this example is that randomness is important, very important. So suppose we allow our two participants to be random instead. So Alice will think of her inputs as an integer between 0 and 2 to the n, and so will Bob. And Alice will just simply take a random prime, take her number mod this random prime, a prime of size roughly n squared, and send this to Bob. And of course, of course the, if the answers are different mod p, then if they are different, so Bob can surely tell that they're unequal. And the point is now that it's, uh, there are so many primes, and it can't be equal mod all these primes. So, so, so when Bob guesses correctly, when, well, when they, they're equal mod p, Bob will guess equal, and he'll guess equal with very high probability. So, and the point of this protocol is now we're suddenly sending log n bits, you know, four log n bits or something instead of n bits, and this is an exponential saving, and this is sort of what we want to achieve. And the point is here that A and B are random, but it's correct for any A and B. It doesn't depend on the randomness of A and B. And it turns out that it's much more efficient to, or robust to study these kind of protocols that's correct for every input with very high probability. And most of what I say in the future will be about such protocols. Um, a very interesting question in communication or, or computation in general is the, the cost of a single instant compared to k independent instances. So intuitively, if we have k instances that has nothing to do with each other, we would expect it to cost k times as much as to solve a single instance. And this is what I call a direct sum property. And when this is not true, we can instead think of the average cost of many instances, and this is called the amortized cost. This is the cost of k instances divided by k. And just as a warning, in computational complexity, it's very rare that we can prove direct sum theorems. So they're usually false, and if they might be true, it's, it's, it's very complicated to prove. Um, so before I go to Mark's contribution, let me briefly recall some basics of information of a discrete random variable, Shannon defined entropy, which is just the sum pi log pi. And we also realized that in one-way communication or storage, this governs the amount of bits we need to store to store a random output of the number of, the, of an element of A. And Huffman coding, for instance, will give you the number of bits that's within one of this entropy. So here we have that communication and informations are the same. And here, direct sums are actually easy, independent things, entropy adds, and since entropy is almost communication, also communication essentially adds. So, so we're in a very good and nice setting. And um, finally, I said we would talk about the information and we'd have correlated inputs. So in fact, entropy is not really what we want, but conditional entropy, which I want to do. But this is sort of the entry that remains in A after we know B. And the mutual information is what B tells you about A, and this is just the difference between the, the entropy and the conditional entropy. 
And here we also have a nice, this is theory going back to the 50s, that this is a number of bits you need to, to send uh, B to somebody who knows A. And uh, amortized is completely true, and if you only send one, does this one time, it, there's some small error term, but, but it's small. Uh, so let me now define information. So the information in the protocol is what Alice learns about Bob's input plus what Bob learns about Alice's input. And if you want that in formulas, it's the mutual information of you know, the probability space A with the, the, the protocol on condition on what that person knows. And of course, I remind you that communication is number of bits sent, but this is a completely mathematical entity that we don't know. So now I'll, in a single slide, I'll tell you several of the great results that Mark did. So it turns out that also here information has a direct sum property. Communication on the hand does not. And in fact, amortized communication complexity is the same as information cost, so it's sort of similar to the one-way situation. But it turns out to be very difficult to bound communication costs and information, and here Braverman had the, the first result, which seemed bad at the time, that communication is at most exponential in the information. But a later result by Ganor, uh, Cole, and Russ proved that th this is in fact as bad as it gets. And here, I won't tell you anything about the proofs, but you should think about many round proofs and very correlated inputs. Uh, so let me switch gears slightly and talk about errors. So we'll have two types of errors, either just random errors, you know, nature changes everything with probability epsilon, or we'll think of errors in an adversarial setting where an adversary can change an epsilon fraction of, of the symbols. And maybe since you're hungry, I won't say so much about the standard case, but random errors are controlled by the um, entropy function. Um, Worst case errors leads into error correcting codes. And there we know, for instance, that that's the size of the alphabet goes into infinity. We can tolerate half, almost half errors and still send meaningful information. Yeah. Yeah. So just to see that errors are rather different in this interactive setting, let, let me give an example, which is a what's called pointer jumping. Here's a binary pointer jumping, but you should really think of this as a k -ary pointer jumping. So Alice has the blue inputs and Bob has the red inputs, and they're supposed to walk down the tree that Alice, for instance, at the root, can I circle the one. She says we should go right, and then Bob says we should go left, and so forth. And then they arrive at a leaf where there's a function value. And their goal of their interaction is to find this function value. If there are no errors, they just do what I just told you, right? They just exchange bits and they walk down the tree and everything is good. But what you might see, if there are errors, you have to be extremely careful here to analyze this function. And now you want to solve this almost as efficiently as the, the error-less protocol by just exchanging a number of bits that are proportional to the depth of this tree. So as soon as there is an error, you're very likely to... to um, to send meaningless information that's not useful. Everything off the path is, is useless, right? Uh, so what could you possibly hope for? So as, as I said, in the one-way setting, we can tolerate almost a fraction of errors a half, and I claim that this goes down to a quarter by a rather trivial reason, because Alice sends half the messages, and if we just try to, to make Alice uh, cut off information from going to Alice to Bob, it's sufficient to delete, you know, destroy half of our messages and she, she won't be able to, to send much information. So this means that you can sort of a quarter is, is the natural barrier here. And a long sequence of results actually t t turns out that this turns out to be the right answer. You, if the alphabet size is large enough, then you can tolerate almost a, a fraction quarter of the errors. And this is a great result by Braverman and Ram. And of course, what this means, you, you can't run the original protocol. You have to modify it to marry, make it error correcting. So for any protocol pi, there's a pi prime that tolerates these errors and achieves exactly the same task. And if you're interested in bits, the same paper uh, show that you can tolerate one-eighth errors, and this has later been 
improved to a six by other authors, and, and that seems to, to be the correct answer. Um, and once you sort of know that something is possible or when it's not possible, of course, we want quantitative questions. And here, a lot of further research is needed. We don't have any good results, but it seems like it's not the entropy function. Maybe it's the square root of the entropy function by result of color and routes. So this should be understood further. And as Mark said in his video, maybe multi-party protocols are also when we have more people, but this is a different story. Uh, so this was all about information complexity. I just want to end by a very, very quick glimpse of something else that Mark did. It's about the topic that I, I like very much and sort of the interaction of randomness and computation. Uh, we'll have a simple model of computation, which is here a small depth circuit. It's of depth three. We have n Boolean inputs and, and, and the NOR gates, and we want this to be of polynomial size. Uh, this was studied already in the 80s, and we, I can't say we understand these circuits, but at least we were able to, unless most type of circuits, we were able to prove strong lower bounds and for simple functions. And for instance, computing parity and majority, if we require polynomial size, we can only compute this for, for very few inputs polylogarithmically. So this says that these circuits are not very good at understanding global properties. So there were lots of conjectures of this general principle, and it took 20 years to resolve this when Mark finally settled the central conjecture here, and that sort of says that if you have random inputs, you can't distinguish this from locally random inputs, inputs that are only polylog and vice independent. And this was really a very nice theorem that was the end of 20 years of struggles for, for circuit complexity. Uh, I'll, I won't say more. I mean, he has done marvelous work also in computations of Julia sets and mechanism design. Maybe he will tell us about this tomorrow when he is giving his presentations, but I just want to say that he's very well, you know, congratulations, Mark. That's what I wanted to say. Congratulations. <laughs> well, <thank you. laughs> Thank you very much. Now I would like to thank the audience for the patience during uh, the very much unintended technical break. And it's time for lunch. We will resume quarter past two. And before that, let's thank all the awardees so far once again. Okay, let's start. So it is time for the Chern Medal Award, and it is my pleasure to welcome again Carlos Kenig, uh, President of the IMU, to introduce the award. Sorry, too many papers here. <laughs> okay, uh, so we will uh, now turn to the Chern Medal Award. The Chern Medal is awarded every four years to an individual whose accomplishments warrant the highest level of recognition for an outstanding achievement in the field of mathematics. This award was established in memory of the outstanding mathematician Xingxian Chern and this award is generously funded by the Chern Medal Foundation. Um, the Chern Medal Award Committee was chosen by the IMUEC. It was chaired by Jakob Eliasberg from Stanford, whose name has been made public, but the remaining members of the committee, whose names were secret until now, are Sun Yang Alice Chang, Henri Darmon, Alice Kione and Hiraku Nakajima. So, uh, unfortunately, the representative of the Churl Medal Foundation, uh, who was going to be here, Robert Bryant, could not make it to Helsinki, 
because first his flights were canceled and then he tested positive. So, so I'm sorry, but there is no representative from the John Medal Foundation. Uh, so uh, I, we're uh, now ready to announce the awardee. So Barry Mazur from Harvard University is awarded the 2022 Chern Medal for his profound discoveries in topology, arithmetic geometry, and number theory, and his leadership and generosity in forming the next generation of mathematicians. And uh, Barry will connect through video. We didn't know it was going to be so brief. I see it. Good. Hi, Barry. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Yes, hi. 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 <laughs> saying something? <laughs> Am I supposed to speak? <laughs> yes. Okay, <laughs> well, it's a wonderful surprise to get the Chern Medal. I want to thank the IMU and the Chern Medal Foundation for that surprise. It gets me to think about the arc of my life with mathematics. Uh, something all mathematicians should do from time to time. And since it's a medal bearing the name and the likeness of Chern, it also gets me to think about Chern's marvelous accomplishments, his work, which is continually opening new fields of mathematics. Mathematics has a great future. Thanks. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Okay, and uh, so now uh, we're going to turn to the video. Hopefully we can see it. Mathematical thought provides a grounding for not only mathematicians, but everyone. If you think of something as simple as the word three, I can imagine someone saw yep. three cows and then three stones and said, hmm, there's some correspondence. And then to develop the noun three from this, that's a big step of the imagination. I came to Harvard as a junior fellow. 60 years after that, I've been teaching at Harvard. To teach math 
effectively, you have to really understand how your student views things. A teacher of mine said, we're all little mice nibbling on the infinite cheese of knowledge. We're never going to consume the cheese, but it's the love of doing it together and how it shapes us that's important. I began thinking of mathematics as a philosophical explanation of something physical, at least at first. The thing that captured my greatest attention was geometry, topology. Knot theory was one of these things. It was a new world for me. To make a knot, you take a piece of string in space, you just let it loop in and around itself, and then eventually you take the two ends and glue them together. That's a knot. And then you ask, suppose you try to untangle or unravel it without tearing, without cutting this closed piece of string, but just moving it through space. Is it possible that you can make it unknotted? Just a perfect circle, but you can lie flat on the plane. Then it would be an unknot. But there are knots that are not unknotted, so to speak. And in fact, you can then begin to classify them. There's the trefoil knot, there's the figure eight knot. There are various other knots that you can imagine constructing. One of the big issues in knot theory is to understand them when our two seemingly different knots, not different, but uh, actually the same, if you can move one into the configuration of the other. Knot theory was an entrance for me to dynamical systems, which led me to algebraic geometry and then to number theory. One of my big theorems is the classification of rational points, and then that developed into a bunch of other things the arithmetic of the Eisenstein ideal, Galois deformation theory. There's also the Iwasawa main conjecture with Andrew Wiles, and I found the stability issues. Those are some of the big things. I keep thinking how lucky I am to have met up with my wife, Gretchen. We raised a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful son. He gave us a marvelous granddaughter, Naya, who's now nine. Gretchen is open to everything and opens everything for me. There's her thrilling novels and stories and essays. Bows, dance with the wind, definition. When I think of what I would be without Gretchen, all I do is shudder. You could walk upright. There's room. We've been together since 1960, 62 years. The ancient Greeks said, what is a friend, another self? He gives meaning to everything that is. Life and work, work and life. I didn't teach him the poetry. He's read more poetry and perhaps more fiction than I have. Lurching, careening, descending. I know people who have been married to three mathematicians. Mm -hmm. They don't go elsewhere after they've been married to one mathematician. Oh, yeah, we have to find out where our I think it's partly because mathematics has proof. So in order to get ahead, you don't need to step on the face of anybody else. I think mathematicians are the sweetest bunch of professional people. And I think he's the sweetest of them all. Being a mathematician, I've certainly acquired the taste for the general, but the soul of any particular thing is, of course, in the details, the way in which a tree fuses its limbs and binds them together. These are the souls of things. You may think that a relationship between two people is a straight line from one to the other. Okay, now we go. But sometimes it's an intertwining curve with beautiful surprises along the way. That is a knot.
Thank you. Uh, I would like to now invite Henri Darmon from McGill to give the laudatio. Uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give giving this laudatio for Barry Mazur. Uh, so the 2022 Chern Medal is awarded to Barry Mazur for his profound discoveries in topology, arithmetic geometry and number theory, and his leadership and generosity in forming the next generation. Let me begin with a few uh, biographical notes. So Barry Mazur was born in 1937 in New York City and uh, graduated from the Bronx High School of Science uh, in 1954. After that, he completed his undergraduate studies at MIT in just two years, and his graduate studies in Princeton in another two years, during which he also spent a half year in Paris, uh, attending the celebrated seminars of Carton and Chevalet. Uh, and then he did a one year of postdoc at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Uh, having completed his entire uh, post high school education in five years, he joined the faculty at Harvard in 1959, and he's been there ever since. Currently, he's a, uh, the Gerhard Gade uh, University professor, uh, uh, prestigious cross-faculty appointment. Through a remarkable career, spanning over six decades at Harvard alone, Barry Mazur has profoundly shaped the scientific outlooks of generations of graduate students and colleagues. And now I want to make a few comments and go over some of the highlights of uh, Barry Mazur's contributions to mathematics and number theory and how they've shaped uh, a lot of what uh, number theorists nowadays uh, uh, do in the subject. Uh, so Barry Mazur's first contributions, as you heard in the video, were in topology, uh, starting with his 1959 thesis at Princeton entitled On Embeddings of Spheres. And in this thesis, he gave a proof of the generalized Schoenflies conjecture, which can be envisaged as a kind of higher dimensional version of the Jordan curve theorem. Uh, now, this uh, result of Mazur took uh, his fellow topologists at the time by surprise. It was based on very elementary but highly ingenious ideas. And uh, in fact, one of his colleagues at the time uh, remarked that Mazur went into the jungle with a string and caught the only lion that could be captured with a string. That was, uh, uh, so, Mazur was awarded a few years later in the, the Veblen Prize in 1966 with Morton Brown for his uh, proof of the generalized Schoenflies conjecture. So, uh, after that, as we heard in the video, uh, Mazur's mathematical interests gradually shifted towards, uh, from topology to more geometric uh, areas, differential and then eventually algebraic geometry. Uh, and in particular, at the time when uh, algebraic geometry was undergoing a profound uh, renewal, transformation, under the influence of Grothendieck and his school. Uh, during this time, Mazur was making frequent visits to the IHES, so he was penetrated with the, the uh, mathematics that was happening there. And he proved an important conjecture of Katz uh, on the Frobenius and the Hodge filtration. And what that, that result leads to is a subtle information about the piadic location of zeros of zeta functions of varieties in characteristic p. Uh, so, so that was one uh, of his important contributions at the time. And he also developed uh, with messing various results on crystalline cohomology, which foreshadow a very important uh, area, namely piadic Hodge theory, whose influence on number theory has only grown over the last uh, decades. 
Uh, okay, now I, I talk more about uh, uh, Barry Mazur's number theoretic contributions. After the algebraic geometry was naturally led to more and more arithmetic uh, topics. And in number theory, as you also heard in the video, one of uh, Mazur's most important uh, contributions was his deep study of torsion points on elliptic curves. Now, an elliptic curve is simply uh, a curve over Q of genus 1 with a distinguished rational point. So that's sort of the technical definition. But these are quite concrete objects. Uh, namely, uh, such a curve can always be expressed as an equation in two variables, x and y, a cubic equation from y squared equals a cubic polynomial in x, where the uh, coefficients a and b are parameters in the equation. Now, to uh, many mathematicians outside of the subject of number theory, this seems like a very special class of equations to consider. Yet they've had a sort of outsized influence on number theory in the past uh, few uh, decades. Uh, and I'll, of course, be going over that in the next few slides. Uh, so what Mazur proved, and what, what I should also say that what distinguishes these curves for special attention is that they have a, a structure of an algebraic group. Namely, there's a, a group, the, the set of solutions of this equation over any field, any field containing the rationals, uh, is endowed with a natural group operation. And that leads us, of course, to some important structure, which gives us a handle on the study of solutions of these equations. So on, on a most immediate level, once you have a bunch of a few solutions, you can generate many more by repeatedly combining them via the uh, algebraic group operation. So Mazur's theorem concerns the elements of this group, which are of finite order, which return to the identity element after a finite number of uh, additions. And the theorem is that if E is an elliptic curve over the rational numbers, it's very much a, a theorem about equations over the rationals, then this torsion subgroup has a very limited range of possibilities. It's isomorphic either to a cyclic group of cardinality either at most 10 or cardinality 12, or a product of a group of order 2 times a cyclic group with these restricted cardinalities 2, 4, 6, or 8. Um, so this re result, uh, I'll now try to give you a bit of a feeling of what kind of ideas go into the proof. Of course, I won't explain the proof in, in the next 10 minutes, uh, but I want to kind of ex try to give a feeling of why it's also been very important in number theory. So uh, first, this theorem can be recast itself as a statement about rational points on another class of curves, the so-called modular curves. And that connection rests on the fact that the collection of all elliptic curves itself can be viewed as a set of points on an algebraic curve. So when I wrote down the general equation for a curve, it depended on these two parameters, A and B. And so and you can make A and B vary continuously among any or algebraically over any field. So you might have the impression there's a two-parameter family of elliptic curves, but not really, because in fact, these A and B can be rescaled by certain common factors. And really, there's a universal elliptic curve, which is a one-parameter family. And there's a unique invariant which characterizes an elliptic curve up to isomorphism, the so-called J invariant. And uh, one can now, out of that, construct a richer class of algebraic curves. So the projective line, where the variable is just a J invariant, is the simplest instance of a modular curve. But there are other uh, examples which classify the extra data of a point on the elliptic curve of a given order. So if we have an integer n, we let y0 of n denote the algebraic curve whose points are naturally in bijection with pairs consisting of an, the elliptic curve and a point, uh, a point of, um, uh, sorry, a, a subgroup of order n on it, but this data being defined over the ground field f. And of course, we consider this data up to isomorphism. And the fact that that set, I don't know if I can use this pointer here. Oh yeah, good. The fact that this set can be identified with the set of solutions of a, of a Diophantine equation in one variable, in other words, an algebraic curve, gives us, of course, a handle on the study of that set. 
And they, uh, this is just a reformulation of the, the essentially of the theorem that I had on the previous slide, but in terms of this modular curve, which is going to play the important role later. And it just simply says that if n is a prime number, then we can completely classify the set of n's for which this curve has no has non-trivial rational points. And they come up in a finite list of equations. Uh, namely, either n is 2, 3, 5, 7, or 13. And in that case, in fact, the, uh, the set of rational points is very big. It's essentially in bijection with a multiplicative group of rational numbers. So there are many, many. In this case, one says that the curve has genus 0, essentially. And then there are other interesting scenarios when n is slightly larger and equals 11 up to 163. And any number theorist in the, in the audience will recognize that list of primes as being essentially the collection of primes for which the class number of the imaginary quadratic field of that discriminant is 1. So the point of this theorem is that the only time that the modular curve has uh, non-trivial rational points is when these arise for an interesting structural reason. And the, the, uh, sorry, the, the, the reason why uh, this uh, condition is related to uh, rational points on y not as n has to do with the theory of complex multiplication, which I, I won't go into. Uh, okay, so how did Mazur go about proving this result? Well, these curves, y not as n, have equations but these equations are extremely complicated. It's not very uh, helpful to uh, study, to, to write them down in studying the Diophantine equation. But what Mazur does rather is study a, a certain higher dimensional variety uh, called the Jacobian of the modular cur of the curve. Now this Jacobian is a higher dimensional variety. Um, but, uh, so generally higher dimensional varieties correspond to Diophantine equations in more than one variable, so they're more complicated to study. But these Jacobians have a group structure, so they can be viewed as higher dimensional analogs of elliptic curves. And that group structure gives us a traction on the study of their rational points. And um, we can think of, pa of this passage of the Jacobian as a kind of a linearization of the problem of studying the rational points on the original uh, modular curve. Uh, and he produces a non-trivial quotient of this Jacobian, uh, which has finitely many rational points, from which it immediately follows already that the curve itself has finitely many rational points, because it embeds as a sub-variety, or as a curve sitting inside that Jacobian. And the existence of this non-trivial quotient rests on the fact that the Jacobian itself has a rich collection of endomorphisms, which arise from Hecke operators acting on spaces of modular forms. And, and really, just as important as the final result that Mays approved, classifying the rational points on modular curves, are the ideas that he had to develop in order to, to carry out what he called this Eisenstein descent, the study of this Eisenstein quotient of the modular curve. And that study rests on deep, uh, on the study of rings generated by Hecke operators and on how they act on these uh, Jacobians of modular curves. Okay, and I'll return to the importance of this result beyond the statement of the torsion result in uh, two, two or three slides from now. Uh, okay, so let me now, but before I do that, I wanna say a few words about the connection between Mazur's theorem and Fermat's last theorem. So Fermat, Mazur's theorem asserts that an infinite collection of curves of increasing arithmetic complexity, but indexed by the integer n. So the larger n is, the more complicated the curve is, the higher its genus, and so on. But you have an infinite collection of such curves, one for each n. And what it says is that um, these curves have no rational points at all once the parameter n is large enough. Now, that statement has very much the same flavor, it's reminiscent of uh, Fermat's last theorem, which makes exactly the same assertion for these so-called uh, Fermat curves uh, with equation given here, xn plus yn equals z to the n. Now, the difference is that Fermat curves, on, initially they look simpler because you can write down their equations, the equations are very uncomplicated, however, it, uh, it was, of course, Mazur's brilliant insight 
that modular curves uh, are more approachable from the point of view of understanding the collection of rational points, thanks to these extra structures, heck operators, and so on. But the relation between Mazur's theorem and Fermat-Lasz theorem turns out to go far beyond a superficial analogy in the statements. And in fact, this theorem of Mazur was one of the critical ingredients and perhaps the most, the key Diophantine ingredient in the eventual proof of Fermat's last theorem by, by Andrew Wiles. And so let me just explain that very quickly. We can co consider other kinds of, other flavors of modular curves. Uh, here I'm going to take the one that classifies elliptic curves with a full basis of points of order n. And um, the key fact is that there are two natural surjective maps to the projective line, uh, a map pi 1 from the Fermat curve. Here I'm going to assume that the exponent is a prime, p, an odd prime. So this is the Fermat curve of exponent p. And this is the modular curve with full level 2p structure. And there is a map pi 2 to the projective line. And these two maps, I'm going to explain now uh, more precisely, have common local features. What do I mean by that? Well. Um, so the map pi 1 is defined in a very simple way. You start with a solution a, b, c, a point on your curve, or a solution to Fermat's last sphere, and you send it to a to the p over b to the p. You send it to that number, which you view as a coordinate on the projective line. Uh, the other map, well, y of 2p, a point on that curve, is given by an elliptic curve together with a basis for the points of order 2 and an extra data of a basis for the points of order p, p being an odd prime. Now, it's, it turns out that the universal family of elliptic curves, the basis of points of order 2, is given by this equation. So it's entirely characterized by a single parameter, t, this, this so-called t in what's called the Legendre family of elliptic curves. And this map pi 2 just forgets about the level p structure, these two points, and sends this whole uh, data, a point on y of 2p, to the parameter t, viewed as a point on p1. And Although these maps look very different on the face of it, they're defined on entirely different curves, uh, they have a striking affinity in, in that they're both ramified only above 0, 1, and infinity, and their ramification degrees are equal, and they're equal to p. So a deep, it turns out that a deep consequence of the modularity of elliptic curves that was proved by Wiles and built on earlier ideas of Fry, Serre, and Ribet is that one can operate a kind of transfer of rational points from the, from the Fermat curve of exponent p to the modular curve y0 of p. And this transfer arises via this diagram. Uh, so um, what we're saying here is that, that if we start with a point on the Fermat curve, we map it down to p1 by pi1, and then we take its inverse image under pi 2 to get a, a collection of points on x of 2p because of what I said in my previous slide, that these two maps have this kind of local affinity, one expects that the field of definition of these lifts, of these pre-images, is going to display a very limited amount of arithmetic ramification. In fact, it will only be ramified at 2 and p, so the discriminant of these fields will be so small. The, a consequence of the modularity so on the other hand, these pre-images are defined over fields of torsion points of elliptic curves. And the modularity of elliptic curves is just a powerful traction on understanding these fields. And what um, uh, was proved then, was a consequence of these very deep ideas, is that the pre-image of this point under this map had to map necessarily to a rational point on the modular curve of level p. So the field of definition does not grow when you follow the point along this map, and particularly in this crucial step where you take a pre-image. So we're saying that there exists a pre-image that maps to a rational point here. But then, so in other words, we've shown that if there is a, a non-trivial solution to Fermat's last theorem, then this modular curve y not a p also has a non-trivial rational point. But that was exactly what Mazur showed does not happen. And so that's what led so by, after transferring this Diophantine question from the, modular curve to the, from the Fermat curve to the modular curve, we are able to invoke Mazur's Diophantine result and conclude uh, Fermat's last theorem. Uh, okay, and now I, I would just say, I hope I still have time, 
something uh, quick about the deformation theory of Galois representations was also mentioned in uh, the video. Uh, so in the early 90s, Mazur launched a new branch of number theory, the, def the theory of deformations of Galois representations, um, by es essentially trying to understand the parameter spaces for local Galois representations, and he found that they were classified by certain local rings. And Weil's proof of the modularity of elliptic curves proceeds by showing that a natural map from a Galois deformation ring to a completed Heck algebra, and these completed Heck algebras were exactly the rings of the kind that had been, whose study had been initiated in Mazur's work on the Eisenstein ideal, uh, is an isomorphism. So the two classes of rings that play a key role in Weil's arguments had really grown out of uh, uh, ideas and theories that Mazur developed. And uh, so one can really see that his, uh, Mazur's ideas are woven into the very fabric of Weil's proof of the modularity of elliptic curves and of Fermat's last theorem. Okay, I'm going to, I think I'm a little bit over my time, so I don't want to outstay my welcome. I'm gonna, uh, I had a further slide where I list a few more of Mazur's uh, important achievements. He championed the, the use of Iwasawa theory techniques in uh, studying elliptic curves. The proof of the main conjecture of Iwasawa theory with, with Andrew Wiles is another major landmark, which was also briefly mentioned in the uh, video. Uh, the formulation of a piatic version of the Bertrand Smith and Dyer conjecture, uh, et cetera, et cetera, various ideas on, on the study of uh, Galois position. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm really not doing justice to all of this. Of course, if we had, uh, if you had wanted a 15 minute talk, which is very complete and very detailed, we should have given the churn medal to someone else, uh, not to Barry Mazur. Uh, okay, so I'll stop here. I should mention that the, um, uh, this award of the Chern Medal is only one, in, uh, you know, it's only the latest in a series of distinctions that Mazur has received uh, for his work. Here's a picture of him in 2013 receiving the National Medal of Science. Uh, in fact, I, I first received this picture by email from one of his students, one of Barry Mazur's students, and he had added a caption to the picture, which was, who is this fellow standing next to Barry Mazur? <laughs> and, uh, I think that, that sort of captures the respect and, and affection with, that Mazur's disciples have uh, for him. Oh yeah, so I'll stop here. And to learn more, let me just mention that uh, there's a longer written version of this uh, Laudatio, uh, which is in the proceedings of this ICM and can probably be found online already now. Um, there's also a more popular article aimed at a broader readership by Alan Jackson on uh, uh, Barry Mazur. And finally, there's a, a lovely 30-minute documentary by Oliver Ralph, which is entitled Barry Mazur and the Infinite Cheese of Knowledge, which is available for streaming without charge for the two weeks that the ICM will be happening. So I encourage you all, to, of course, to look at that. It's a very, very nice uh, uh, little video about Mazur. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we will have a music performance. We will have Ilkka Heinonen on Jouhikko playing two pieces, Käki, Kuku, and Kellot, Bells. But first, I will tell you a bit about both Ilkka and Jouhikko. So Jouhikko is about string instrument with two to four strings that has been played in Karelia, uh, sovereign eastern Finland, and on the west coast of Estonia. The earliest written descriptions of the Jouhikko date back to the 17th century, but in the early 20th century, the tradition of Jouhikko was already on the verge of extinction, with accordion and violin replacing Jouhikko as the accompaniment to dance. In the 80s, interest in Jouhikko began to, began to revive, and today Jouhikko is again gaining reputation as a distinctive instrument for both clubs and concert halls. Ilkka Heinonen is a Helsinki-based musician and a composer playing Jouhikko, double bass and G violone. He is specialized in Northern European traditional music, um, but has also been working actively in early music and contemporary music scenes. He is completing his artistic doctoral, doctoral degree in Sibelius Academy, University of Arts, Helsinki. The compositions of this performance are part of uh, Heinonen's research on the expressive possibilities of Jouhikko. Käki combines the variation styles of Karelian Jouhikko players with the vir virtuoso alla pastada variation style of the 16th century viola da gamba players. Cantus firmus of the composition is a well-known Finnish folk tune, Kukku, Kukku, 
which was also in the repertoire of Karelian Yohiko players with its uh, per peculiar variations. The second composition, uh, Kellot, or Bells, have been inspired by the Orthodox Church bell playing, which Karelian Yohiko players probably ha heard regularly, as well as the church bell imitations of plucked sitter, Kantele, players in the same area. And the second composition is divided into three parts, uh, large bells, small bells, and all bells together. Please, Ilka.
much, Ilka. Then it is time for the Carl Friedrich Gauss Prize, and I invite Carlos Koenig um, to represent the, uh, present the prize. Thank you. Um, so we now turn to the Gauss Prize. The Gauss Prize was created to highlight the fact that mathematics is a driving force behind many advances in science and technology. The prize is to honor scientists whose mathematical research has had impact outside mathematics. The Gauss Prize is awarded jointly by the DMV, the German Mathematical Society, and the IMU. The source of the prize is a surplus from the ICM 1998 held in Berlin. The Gauss Prize Committee was chosen by the IMU EC. It was chaired by Eva Tardos from Cornell University, whose name has been made public. The remaining members of the committee, whose names were secret until now, are Liliana Borchea, Albert Cohen, Bernd Stuhlfels, and Tao Tang. I would like now to uh, call the representative of the DMV, Professor Ilka Agricola, to vote. Oh. Thank you. Okay, so I now am ready to announce the recipient. Elliot Lieb from Princeton University is awarded the 2022 Gauss Prize for deep mathematical contributions of exceptional breadth, which have shaped the fields of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, computational chemistry, and quantum information theory. Now we will have a video connection with Elliot Lieb. Can you hear us, Elia? Don't think he can hear us. Am I muted? No, tell him he should unmute himself. Well, uh, Elliot, can you unmute yourself? Can you hear me? No. Yes. Good. Well, thank you very much, Carlos, for this uh, great honor. It's a, a great honor to be associated with uh, one of the greatest mathem mathematics. Shall I stop? I think I am. I think I'm unmuted. Video is unmuted. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. It doesn't. We hear you fine. Please go ahead. Yes. Does it... <laughs> so, I am unmuted. I am unmuted. Yes. And we can hear you. <laughs> yes. All right, well, I guess you won't see me, <laughs> except for the video. I don't know what is wrong. No, uh, we can so, hear you fine. Yes. We can hear you perfectly well, Elliot. So anyway, thank you. Yes, I am unmuted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Mm-hmm. All right. So thank you. There's a 35, 45 second delay, which is yeah. causing great trouble. Yeah. But we can hear you. All right. So, uh, thank you, Carlos, for this uh, great honor from the IMU and from the German Mathematical Society. It's a great honor to be associated with one of the greatest mathematical physicists of all time. Uh, <clears throat> Go ahead. You can go ahead, Elliot. And I will stop now. Thank you. So we will now uh, see the video and we'll have a laudatio by Rupert Frank from LMU Munich. I graduated MIT in 1953 with a BS in physics. And then I went to the University of Birmingham in England to do a PhD in 1956. I did not see my way to producing uh, really good science for a while, maybe four years. And uh, I, those four years were spent uh, just being unsure of myself. When I went to IBM in 1960, I met two physicists, Ted Schultz and Dan Mattis, and all of us discovered that we had an interest in actually proving things in a rigorous way. Things involving statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics and other things where there was a high mathematical component. We thought about uh, these things differently from the way most physicists did at the time. The theoretical physicist uh, typically uh, wants to get an answer. It's like going over stepping stones. He can jump when he feels like jumping as long as he gets to the other side. But in mathematical physics, you don't do that. If the final mathematical result is going to be effective, it's got to be completely rigorous. At Northeastern University, I managed to solve the problem of the entropy of ice. Imagine you have two-dimensional ice where the n oxygens are arranged in a two-dimensional lattice and in between every two oxygens there sits a hydrogen atom with the constraint that two hydrogens must be close to every oxygen. The entropy of ice is then the logarithm of the number of hydrogenic configurations with this constraint. And the solution is four-thirds to the three-halves n where n is the number of oxygen atoms. That created a big stir at the time. I received an invitation to MIT's mathematics department in 1968. At MIT, I worked on the stability of matter. But the stability of matter is something that most physicists didn't care about. Because after all, matter is stable, we can hit it with a hammer. So what is, what is there to prove? First, there's the thermodynamic limit problem, which is that the volume of matter 
is proportional to the number of atoms. Joe Leibowitz and I managed to solve this problem. We invented something called the cheese theorem. You take balls of a certain size and put as many as you can in this domain you're trying to pack, and then you pack the missing space with those smaller balls, which allows for an exponentially fast packing of a domain by spheres. The second aspect of stability of matter is how do we know that the energy of a system is proportional to the number of atoms in the system? We had to invent a piece of analysis called the leap tiering bound, which refers to the negative spectrum of the Schrodinger equation. This bound, which we eventually proved, together with the Thomas Fermi theory work that I had done with Barry Simon, would imply that the energy is proportional to the number of atoms. Sometimes things take a turn which is totally unexpected. For example, there's an algebra named after Neville Temporally and myself, which we discovered while working on a problem in quantum statistical mechanics. This is called the Temporally Lieb algebra. It is useful in many areas like braids and knots and curves that are constrained not to intersect. I went to Princeton in 1974. While there in the 1990s, one big thing I did was with Jakob Ingvarsson, we revised the traditional understanding of the second law of thermodynamics and the meaning of entropy and its role. We even wrote a paper about this for the notices. It received the Conant Prize. The introduction of uh, pure mathematics into physics, not only checks things, it can give rise to new directions and concepts in physics. Right now I'm 89, soon to be 90. I still do research every day and hope that maybe another good idea will hit me again. Thank you. Uh, so I invite uh, Rupert Frank to, for the Laudatio. So dear colleagues and friends, dear Elliot, it is an honor and a pleasure for me to give this Laudatio for the um, Gauss Prize which, as we just learned, was awarded for Elliot Leap's deep mathematical contributions of exceptional breadth that shaped the fields of quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, computational chemistry, and quantum information theory. Elliot Leap has already said he's a mathematical physicist. This is an area of mathematics which Freeman Dyson described as the discipline of people who try to reach a deep understanding of physical phenomena by following the rigorous style and method of mathematics. Elliot Leap's work has had a great impact in both fields of physics and of mathematics. And while we gathered here today to celebrate mostly the mathematical side of Leap's work, I think it is appropriate to mention that about half a year ago, Elliot Leap was awarded the 2022 Medal for Exceptional Achievement in Research by the American Physical Society. That's the highest honor bestowed by that um, society, and it recognizes his major contributions to theoretical physics. His work is really monumental. His list of publication at the moment consists of 404 papers, the first one going back all the way to 1955, and the most recent one still in press. If you like more numbers, he has more than 82,000 citations on Google Scholar and an age index of 118. The highlights of his work have been collected in four different volumes, amounting to more than 2,800 pages. And together with Laptev, Levine, and Saringa, I was recently involved in editing two volumes that appear on the occasion of his 90th birthday, which is coming up at the end of this month. I've compiled here a list 
long list but incomplete list of areas that Elliot Leap has worked in. Let me begin with his work in the 1960s on models of statistical mechanics and especially on exactly solvable models. Um, this work has really revolutionized the field. It has changed how one thinks about modern statistical mechanics and in mathematics, the field of integrable probabilities. This is the work that has been mentioned in the physics price citation, and uh, these are among the, the, his um, most cited papers. The next topic here, the mathematics of the Bose gas. This is a display of his great stamina to work for many, many years, for many decades, on difficult and hard problems. The first paper he published in 1960 on that subject, and the most recent one last year. In 1962, he introduced the Lieb-Linegar model, which is an absolute classic in this field, and which has been experimentally realized and experimentally investigated. And this is, by the way, not the only one of his works that have been uh, tested experimentally. In 1998, together with Ingwersson, he was able, so you see, I mean, this is uh, 40 years almost, he has been thinking, working on this and uh, studying this, but finally in 1998, together with Jakob Ingwersson, he has been able to prove a formula for the ground state energy of a post gas in the dilute limit. And this, together with follow-up work by Saringer and Soloway and many others, really have shaped mathematical physics in the last 20 years and helped us understanding Bogolyubov's pairing theory from a rigorous point of view. Let me move on to the area of entropy inequalities and matrix analysis. Elliot Leap has worked on this uh, for a long time, but the real breakthrough came in 1973 when he proved what came to be known as Leap's concavity theorem. And not only solved, did this solve a conjecture that had been around, he also used it together with Roskai to prove the strong subadditivity of the quantum mechanical entropy. Now, three decades later, this theorem has come to play a really foundational role in the emerging area of quantum uh, information theory and quantum computation. Just to give you a little idea of how basic this uh, theorem is, um, let's think about the entropy, the relative entropy, as a measure of how well you can distinguish two states. And so now you have your two quantum states and you apply a quantum, inf uh, quantum operation on these two states. And so when you apply an operation, then you lose sort of information and therefore the states are harder to distinguish. And that is in fact true. That can be phrased as a neat mathematical inequality and that can be proved using Leap's concavity theorem. It's often nowadays called uh, the data processing inequality. Okay, and this really lies at the bottom of almost every paper in, in quantum information theory. And this is not the only example of a work of Leap that he did and many, many years later has reappeared in other areas. For instance, the Leap-Robinson bounds are very crucial again in um, quantum information and also in condensed matter physics. There's another a um, complex of works concerning the quantum Coulomb problem. This contains these works of um, stability of matter and the Lipterian inequality that we've heard about in the video. I would like to come back to those in a little bit and now talk a little about the contributions of Elliot Leap to real and functional analysis. There are the brass camp leap inequalities there's a family of inequalities that again has the tendency to appear unexpectedly in seemingly unrelated areas, in convexity theory, in harmonic analysis. And then there's his work on the sharp constant in the hardy littlewood sobolev inequality and the precise Leap lemma. Um, you all know from your courses in measure theory for twos inequality, right? That's an inequality. What precise leap tell you is that you can make turn this into an equality when you when you add the appropriate term. So this is really again a foundational result in measure theory, 
And um, this, together with the sharp constant, how the little bit Sobolev inequality, these are his most cited papers in uh, pure mathematics. And finally, I'd like to mention the fundamental uh, contributions uh, that he made to the theory of uh, symmetric decreasing rearrangement. Now let me go a little bit into more detail concerning one of these subjects that I mentioned, namely quantum Coulomb systems. Okay? So what I want to think about is a system consider, consisting of n electrons, those are quantum mechanical particles, and they move in the presence of nuclei, which I want to think of as classical and fixed at certain positions. The system is governed by a linear operator, and the quantity of interest is its lowest eigenvalue, or more precisely, the bottom of its spectrum. And it's important that one considers this operator on the Hilbert space of antisymmetric functions. This reflects the fact that the particles are fermions and therefore obey Pauli's exclusion principle. The key difficulty in this problem is, I mean, even though it's a linear problem, the difficulty is that these numbers, n and k of electrons and nuclei, can be huge. See, when you have an atom, then, I don't know, with, with 15 or 20 electrons, you have to solve a PDE in a 45 or 60 dimension, right? That's numerically very, very hard, if possible at all. But the Hamiltonian also is supposed to describe matter, and then you can easily have particle numbers of 10 to the 26 or something, all right? So this really calls for analytical methods uh, to study this, both Mm, to, I mean, for fundamental reasons, you want to you wanna understand what can you say about such systems if you cannot say anything uh, numerically. But also, of course, num in numerics, one uses some approximations, and this leads to the mathematical question of justifying how good these approximations are and as rigorously estimating these errors. One of the theoretical questions that you can ask in this connection is the question about stability of matter. The difficulty here is that every particle interacts with every other particle. So the number of interactions scales like the square of the particle numbers. Yet the theorem of stability of matter says that the ground state energy only behaves linearly in the number of particles. Right? I mean, that's everyday life. If you have two separate liters of water and you pour them together, you don't get anything more exciting than two liters of water. This is a linear law. All right? and, but this is really fundamental, and uh, this was mentioned by him, and this is really the, where the anti-symmetry, where the Pauli exclusion principle enters crucially. This was proved first by Dyson and Lenar at, in the late 60s, and then Liebentiering gave a new proof which gave a, a realistic value of this constant that is involved in this bound, and also clarified the conceptual mechanism behind this result, and then allowed Lieb to prove similar results over several decades in more complicated models. I have already mentioned that there are approximate models, how you want to attack computing the ground state energy of such a system. One of the oldest and simplest is the Thomas Fermi energy functional. What you do here is you tr uh, trade the high dimensionality against the nonlinearity. Right? So you have here a function rho, which is defined, the density, which is defined on R3. That's low dimension, but you, the, functional, the rho enters the functional uh, quadratically into the power of five thirds. This had been around in uh, physics since the earliest days of, of quantum mechanics, but it was only in the 1970s that Lieb and Simon established this theory rigorously mathematically, and they proved also that this theory is asymptotically in exact in a limit, uh, in a certain asymptotic limit. And what is perhaps the most surprising approximation in this Thomas Fermi theory is that you replace, whoops, what happened? That you replace the uh, kinetic energy by this rho to the five thirds term. And Lieb and Thiering proved 
in what became known as the leap theorem inequality, that this hand-waving Thomas Fermi uh, approximation really is a rigorous lower bound, at least when you change the constant in the inequality. Okay, and this has created a huge literature. This appeared both in pure mathematics, it appears in connection with the Navier-Stokes equation. It's really a, a fundamental principle. And if I may say that, um, I will give a, a lecture next week on that topic for, for those who are interested in this. Once you have this leap Turing inequality, the proof of stability of matter follows rather directly using properties of Thomas Fermi theory. Now, Leap didn't stop there. He also investigated, for instance, the approximation to the electron-electron repulsion and the error there. This is a bound that is well known in quantum chemistry and guides the thinking there about the exchange correlation energy. And staying with quantum chemistry, there is density functional theory. This is really the method of choice that you use in, or people use in industry to compute the ground state configuration of atoms or molecules or solids, right? And Leap uh, wrote a foundational paper on that theory, um, again, long before it became popular in the 90s, and he introduced what came to be known as the Levy-Leap functional. And recently, together with uh, Levin and Saringer, he justified what is known as the local density approximation, which underlies um, this theory. So, um, this was a very quick um, overview over six decades of research in, in 15 minutes. Um, I could not cover everything, I was way too fast, I know, but I would be delighted if some of you would uh, take this as a motivation to look at his original papers, and uh, I would like it very much if you would enjoy them as much as I do. On a personal note, I have had the, the um, great opportunity to work with Elliot for some time. I learned a lot from him about mathematics, physics, and life in general. I would like to thank him very much for that. And I would like to ask you all to join me in congratulating Elliot on the receipt of the medal. Thank you. Okay, it is time for our last but not least uh, prize, the Lila Vati Prize. And again, I invite Carlos Koenig to present the prize. So uh, we now turn to the Lila Vati Prize. The Lila, the Lila Vati Prize, generously sponsored by Infosys accords high recogn recognition and great appreciation from the IMU on behalf of the mathematical community and emphasis of outstanding contributions for increasing public awareness of mathematics as an intellectual discipline and the crucial role that it plays in diverse human endeavors. The, the Lilavati Prize Committee was chosen by the IMU EC and Infosys. It was chaired by Pavel Ettingov from MIT, whose name was made public. The remaining members of the committee, whose names were secret until now, are Michel Artigue, Chandrasekhar Chare, and uh, Karan Sandararajan, and Tadashi Tokieda. So I would like to invite Barna Mera from Infosys to the stage. So uh, now it's time to announce the Lilavati Prize. Uh, the 2022 Lilavati Prize is awarded in, to Nikolai Andreev from the Steklov Institute for his contributions to the art of mathematical animation and of mathematical model building in a style which inspires the young and the old alike and which mathematicians around the world can adapt to their varied uses as well as for his indefatigable efforts to popularize genuine mathematics amongst, 
among the public via videos, lectures, and a prize-winning book. So, uh, Nikolai Andreev. So now we turn to the video and uh, the Laudatio by Tadashi Tokeda from Stanford, which will be received uh, by video also. Okay. So uh, the video, please. Математика. Она изучает основу нашего мира, выкристаллизовывает общие принципы различных явлений. Математика очень красивая наука. Она сама по себе интересна и увлекательна. А кроме того, является мощным инструментом в руках человечества. Наша цель – передать эти ощущения людям, особенно молодежи. Родился я в Саратове на берегу Великой русской реки Волги. С детства – походы, показавшие красоту и разнообразие нашей большой страны. Параллельно со школы – музыкальная по классу скрипки. Последние два года – классическая советская физико-математическая школа. В Москву приехал учиться уже в университет. После студенчества и аспирантуры на мехмате Московского государственного университета моим домом стал математический институт имени Стеклова Российской академии наук. Главный математический центр России. С 2010 года заведую созданной лабораторией популяризации и пропаганды математики. Мне повезло застать и близко общаться с великими старшими товарищами. Именно это общение немного научило меня математике, жизни. Выработал некоторый вкус, научила отличать, что есть правильно, что нет, что красиво, что нет. Эти знания и стараюсь передавать дальше. В России великие традиции популяризации математики. Мы стараемся сохранять их и развивать, облекая при этом в новую современную форму. Одна из важнейших традиций – не только показать увлекательный фокус, но и постараться объяснить суть явления. Сами математики, глубоко понимая науку, Рассказывают ее молодежи, как на лекциях, так и в личном общении. Передают не только научные знания, но и отношение к литературе, искусству, жизненный опыт. Современное общество, увы, очень прагматично. Поэтому один из способов увлечь математикой – показать человеку, где она появляется в его жизни. Примеров масс, но мы зачастую просто проходим мимо. А если замечать окружающую нас математику, то и жить будет интереснее, да и сделать в жизни можно будет гораздо больше. Некоторые примеры можно найти в нашей книге «Математическая составляющая». Ее авторами являются ведущие российские математики. Всю жизнь запоминают встречи с продуманными, красиво изготовленными, наглядными математическими моделями.
Такие объекты притягивают и позволяют буквально прикоснуться к математическим фактам и теоремам. В нашей лаборатории большая коллекция таких моделей. Еще больше идей представлено на сайте. Надеюсь, наглядные модели появятся и в наших школах. Фильмы проекта «Математические этюды» созданы с использованием математически выверенной компьютерной графики. Как и в книге, есть сюжеты о приложениях математики, но есть и рассказы о красивых, ярких, иногда нерешенных математических задачах. Фильмы сопровождаются научно-популярными статьями. Как и книга, они рассчитаны на то, что над ними будут размышлять. По материалам проектов у нас проходит много лекций в различных уголках нашей большой страны, в совершенно различных аудиториях, чаще всего школьникам и учителям. Так, у нас было два противоположных основания, да? Ширина будет уменьшаться. Но собирается полиограмма, которая как -то... На лекциях, в общем-то, нельзя чему-то научить, но можно постараться заинтересовать, чтобы потом человек полез на сайт, в книге, сам стал разбираться. Для меня один из показателей, что лекция удалась, когда какой-нибудь скучающий в начале школьник с задних рядов к концу лекции уже увлеченно слушает и участвует в обсуждении. Помочь преодолеть барьер непонимания и, как следствие, боязнь математики – одна из задач наших проектов. Этим и объясняется слово «пропаганда» в названии нашей лаборатории. Мне кажется, материал наших проектов стали востребованы благодаря их качеству. В мире, живущем по законам рынка, осуществить такие затеи практически нереально. А наш главный приоритет, не считаясь со временем и усилиями, сделать насколько можем хорошо, чтобы зацепило, чему-то научило, сработало. Ничего бы не было без небольшой, но преданной команды высокопрофессиональных ребят. За 20 лет существования проекта времена бывали тяжелые, но ребята остались верны нашим идеям посвящая всю свою жизнь нашему общему делу. Ничего не было бы и без коллег, которые поддерживают нашу деятельность. Многие идеи и сюжеты рождаются именно в этом общении. В итоге, фильмы серии «Математические этюды», книга «Математическая составляющая», коллекция наглядных моделей, просчитано больше тысячи лекций. Надеюсь, еще реализуем и другие интересные задумки. Все сделанное нами принципиально выкладываем в открытый доступ. Мне очень приятно, что работа нашей команды приносит удовольствие познания многим людям. Надеюсь, что и в будущем наш проект помогут кому-то полюбить математику. Thank you very much, and uh, now we will uh, turn to Laudatio by Tadashi Tokieda from Stanford. In the realm of visual and tactile mathematics, Nikolai Nikolaevich Andreev is a master of a wondrous art of animation and of model building. Animation differs from simulation. It is a cartoonish video 
of a story unfolding in front of our eyes and precipitating some mathematical surprise. Delightful to watch. Models differ from 3D printing. They are made by hand, of wood or paper, entertaining to touch and manipulate. His animation and models are minimalist, yet executed with consummate craftsmanship. Andreev's signature style of this art captures the imagination of both the young and the old and offers potential for a variety of uses in the popularization of mathematics. In parallel, he is recognized for tremendous resilience in often overcoming hardship to continue kindling enthusiasm for mathematics among a large number of people of all life circumstances via web resources, lectures, and a book. For these, he is being awarded the 2022 Lelabati Prize. Eastern Europe has a grassroots tradition harking back to the era of Chebyshev of organizing nationwide ladders, so to speak, of mathematical activities from small children to college students. Some of it has been exported abroad as witnessed by math circles that flourish in hubs of initiative around the globe today. Out of this tradition came Quant, arguably the highest quality magazine of popularization in mathematics and theoretical physics that the world has seen, commanding in its heyday a circulation of 200,000. As of 2012, a younger sibling, Kvantik, came into action. It is to this tradition that Andreev, or Kolya to his many friends, was born in 1975 in Saratov, and to this tradition that he has claimed to be a leading successor in our 21st century. His early training was as a researcher. Andreev graduated from the Faculty of Mechanics and Mathematics of Moscow State University completing a candidate's degree, that is PhD, in the year 2000, in the area of extremal problems and approximation theory, codes and designs. In the same year, he began working at Steklov Mathematical Institute, where he has been based ever since. 2002 marked a watershed Andreev gathered a team of R.A. Kokcharov, senior developer web design, M.A. Kalinichenko, graphics video producer, N.M. Panyunin, mathematics, and created the project Mathematical Etude. The project is a treasure trove of animation videos available to everybody free of charge. Each video gives a brief but genuine mathematical experience of an interesting point that is elementary but little known. As such, it is orthogonal to the common practice of presenting journalistically a fashionable topic. He also recruited A.D. Leshinsky, a right of stunning skill who realizes curious mathematical phenomena in beautiful wooden models. In 2010, Andreev was appointed head of the Laboratory of Popularization of Steklov Institute. The productions of his lab include, alongside the ongoing growth of the Etude Plus models, the collection Mechanisms by Chebyshev, 
movable gadgets which make intriguing uses of classical mathematics. And the book, Mathematischeskaya Sestablierischeya, which we may translate freely as Mathematical Take on Things, an anthology of about 30 mathematicians on the luxuriant diversity of material, reminiscent of Quant. The book, first published 2015 by him, S.P. Konovalov, Panyunin, Kokshadov, earned a gold medal for scientific writing, 2017. The second edition, more than double in content, followed in 2019. Andreev travels the length and breadth of a vast continent to deliver lectures well over a thousand in 20 years, reaching out to, by now, countless members of the public, especially the adolescents. Time and again, extraordinary dedication and perseverance saw his cause through. Chronic administrative and financial trammels, endless negotiations and setbacks. Whenever his team's funding dried up, he divided his own salary in equal parts among himself and the other staff of the team in order to keep the work alive. For all his accomplishments, much of Andreev's career is still ahead of him. We salute Kolya as one representative of the community of mathematicians through the centuries who gave of themselves selflessly and at times courageously to doing mathematics with each rising generation. We look forward to being raised by his future work for decades to come. small gift to our university. <laughs> in, the film you could, in the film you could see that uh, uh, the uh, radius of inner and outer uh, uh, rails are different, yes? And there are no differential. Uh, the cylindrical uh, wheels will not work. Can you see on uh, the rail? Yes. Uh, Come on. So here is the railway, yeah? Uh, and uh, the, you, can, you could see that the cylindrical wheels will not work, uh, but uh, geometry helps. Uh, conic conical wheels are working. And in Alt University, uh, they can see this. Uh, and maybe uh, I have uh, 
Nee, Royal, I have some other gifts for winners. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they are not here, yes. Uh, maybe uh, in the uh, afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you for that. Okay. Well, so, uh, the main program is now over. I just want to end with a few final words. Uh, first, thank you all for your participation in this unprecedented award ceremony. I would like to reiterate the IMU's thanks to our Finnish colleagues for their great help in making this ceremony a reality and to the Finnish dignitaries that have honored us with their presence. My warmest congratulations. So my warmest congratulations go to all the award recipients for their wonderful contributions to mathematics that have been recognized here today. I reiterate the IMU's gratitude to all the committee members who have selflessly spent a lot of their time working on the prize committees. I know very well I know very well that this is a difficult and time-consuming work. It is very much appreciated by the IMU and by our community. A few words need to be said about the mathematical community and its generosity of spirit. The IMU Prize Committees reach out to hundreds of colleagues all over the world for advice on their difficult decisions. Almost invariably, this advice is freely given, wisely and without hesitation, even though this can be difficult and extremely time-consuming. This generosity of spirit is heartwarming, it should make us all proud to be a part of this community. Tomorrow is the opening day of the virtual ICM. Taking advantage of the fact that the Fields Medalist and the Abacus Medalist are all here in Helsinki today, they will be giving their ICM plenary talks live here in front of a live audience. Their lectures will, of course, be streamed via the virtual ICM platform for those not fortunate enough to be in Helsinki today or tomorrow. <laughs> See you all tomorrow at the virtual ICM. Thank you. I would also like to thank the audience once again for participating in this award ceremony. Thank you and have a nice, safe trip back home. <laughs>